The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then... Oh shit! It's Vince Russo! Vince McMahon's best kept secret. I am the anti-Christ of professional wrestling! Damn it, I can't run the world title! I've got a wife, three kids at home, and I really don't need this shit. How can this show be so awful, Mr. McMahon? I didn't think it was. But Angle on a pole match. And Hogan, you big bald son of a bitch, kiss my ass. Judy Bagwell on a forklift match. McMahon and the family, the rock, they screwed us all. Now you're the editor, right? Yes, I'm from New York. I'll get down right nasty. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. I don't think I've ever had a swerve like this before. And I'll tell you why. Listen, everybody knows that I have my detractors out there. And I have people that absolutely hate me. But I, I think I'm safe in saying... Those that hate me, I don't think they hate me because it's it was anything personal. Because I honestly, I don't think I'm a bad guy. I never really, uh, I don't think I treated anybody badly or disrespectful. So I don't, I don't ever think it was anything on the personal level. I think people hate me uh, because a lot of it was professional. And I think you know some people have hard have a hard time um, separating professional from personal, and that hurts me quite frankly, because I don't dislike anybody. And I think the person I'm about to bring on is, I think this is a person that has had some differences with me in the past, but I want to say this up front, and I think he knows this, and this is why I'm glad we're talking, and, and I'm, I think this is going to be very insightful. I always liked this guy. I always liked him, never had an issue with him, always thought he was a nice guy, always thought he was a stand-up guy. So when I was feeling that he might not have been feeling the same to me, towards me, it, it hurt my feelings, to be honest with you. Some guys, listen, they hate me, and I really don't care because I really don't like them. I, I'm going to be honest with you. So whether I make amends with some people or not, I really don't care. But this guy, I liked. Magnus, how are you doing this morning, my friend? I, I'm glad that I'm not having decaf. I think I needed to keep up with you. Now, Magnus, I got to say that I had, a, I had a chuckle a little bit this morning when you, you know, at the last minute you asked me if this was on video with a question mark. Like, Magnus, let, let's be honest, bro. Like, you really have to try and look handsome before you do an interview with me. Oh, look, I had to make, well, I was just making sure that, because well, one thing I'd had my bionic arm on, and then like two, I had to make sure that I was actually dressed because you know I wake up in the morning and I take care of my son, and it's you know some some days like you, you don't you don't you know how it is like you don't get you don't even get five minutes to yourself to uh, to you know make yourself look presentable. I've walked out the door and I like okay, you you used to give me a lot of crap about you know uh, oh handsome. So I used to you know I, I, since I've had a since I've had a baby. I've I've walked out the door some days and just uh, not even realizing what I'm wearing or like my hair's all messed up, everything like that. And, and, and so I realized that I suddenly realized that you do a lot of your stuff on video. So I just wanted to double check with you so I could make sure I was like at least semi presentable. Now, Magnus, we ha listen, we have to talk about this because you, you just brought it up. I did it, okay? Bro, you were always the most uh, wanted, eligible bachelor that I ever worked with. That's a <laughs> shoot, bro. Bro, listen, I, let, let's call – this interview is going to be me and you calling a spade a spade because I know you're a very honest guy and so am I. Bro, you used to be the cat's meow. <laughs> All the girls wanted you, and bro, let, listen. Let, let's let's be honest, including the the president of TNA Wrestling, who was all over you like a cheap suit at times. Let the truth be known. And this is how I know Magnum. I know what Magnus. I used to look in those crystal blue eyes, and I'll be honest with you, bro. Sometimes I used to want you. Not that there's anything wrong with that. 
But now all of a sudden I'm getting this email, Vince, yeah, I get up at the crack of dawn with Donovan and I change his diaper and I feel, bro, how the heck did we go from the world's most eligible bachelor <laughs> to changing Donovan's diapers, bro? How did we get from point A to point B? Well, I mean, I, you, have, you have children. I don't think you need me to explain specifically how that works and how we got from that point. But um, I, uh, yeah, I, I guess um, the, the right person finally came along and, and uh, tied an anchor to me. You know what I mean? Oh, Let me terrible. tell you why I always liked you, Magnus, because I think you hit the nail on the head there. And I'm going to be honest with you. Bro, I love, I love having this conversation with you because I want to hear your point of view. I think I can enlighten things, you to some things you never m may have realized before. And I think yeah. we both look at things differently. But let me tell you why I always liked you. Magnus, like, listen, I'm, I'm 54 years old. I have three grown children. So, like, I was always in a, in a position that you're in now. Like, the little stuff doesn't really matter. Like, I'm not going to – this too – life is too important. So I, I was always that way. I I never seem to – I always seem to have an issue, Magnus, with the, with the wrestler that took it way, way, way too seriously. And, like, because here I was, you know, like I said, I, I've got three grown kids. I've been through it all, and I was like, you know, bro, th this, is, this is not real. This is ridiculous. All it is is a job. But the guys that took it way too seriously – were the guys that I kind of had issues with. You and I, sometimes, you know, we were at odds. Uh, sometimes we had some intense arguments. But the thing I got to say about this, Magnus, I always respected about you, you were never a mark for Magnus, in my opinion. In my opinion, you always treated it like a business and like a job, and you were very professional, and you were never over the top of taking your career, you know, life and death seriously. Is that a fair assessment? I hope so. Um, and, and it's, I always thought that about myself, but you know, it's a tough, it's a tough judgment to make about yourself, you know, because you, you know, obviously it's, it's a very subjective thing. Um, I did take, I did take uh, issue a little bit when it was sort of inferred to me by John Gaburik that I was perhaps you know, taking my character a little too seriously and, and and stuff like that. When I raised a few sort of concerns and issues about sort of the way things were going when I was champion, so it's it was interesting for me because I would cite some of those days where I was uh, working for you. Let, let's say as an example, you know, where I would think like I lost so many matches uh, you know i like i was i would go out as especially when we were doing the british invasion character because i understood what those characters were supposed to be we were like we were we were light relief to a degree and then slowly built our credibility through having sort of you know through doug's wrestling ability and and my ability on the microphone and slowly we built some credibility where then later on we could sort of be plugged into more serious stuff with say like a beer money or machine guns or whoever it was but but certainly a lot of our job at that point was to come out in you know union jack tights and union jack jackets and and be sort of a little bit of light relief and say pompous you know things that so that then you know eventually like the the big american baby face could come and kind of Shut us, shut us up and, and have us show our ass a bit like I was and and I understood that and also I think maybe it's just because of my pedigree in, in 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 wrestling like we I came up on the the holiday camps in the UK where it's it's 100 percent like gaga it's all like walk and talk and like it, you know it's so 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 crowd interactive and you know almost over the top kind of looney tunes kind of wrestling and that so to me i you know there were i never heard a single i never heard a single uh discussion or a conversation backstage at any wrestling show regarding like who's winning and who's losing and you know or, or how it's done or anything like that until i came to america like yeah. that i had never heard a conversation about that stuff until i came to america i i never thought for a second my god 
how much could these British fellas hate the fact that they come over here, we put them in the Union Jack. It's so stereotypical. It's it's England against the Americas, and like how freaking like pathetic and ridiculous is that? And the right. fact that you know the fact that you sit here and tell me that now, I'm like, yeah, bro, like you're dead on. Being that I'm not British, I I, I bro, I was never in England. When you and I knew each other, I didn't go there till the last year. I've yeah. been there three times. Now I understand British wrestling a little bit more, and I love it. But I had no idea uh, what you know what what somebody from England represented. So that in itself had to be extremely frustrating to you. Yes, but I it, but also to that point, it, it, you you can you know you can hold your hands up and. And, and say that, you know, in hindsight, you saw something now. I can also uh, admit that, yes, at the time, I was thinking to myself, like, God, this is so, like, we're pigeonholed here. Like, I'm never going to, you know, this, this, there's, no, there's no kind of upward mobility with this character. It's very much like, oh, this is a stereotype and it's going to run its course. And, like, I don't like it. But now, in hindsight, I can look back at it and go, it gave me a... a, a brilliant opportunity to improve whilst also getting regular tv time and i've emphasized the word regular like every every week um it also you know you you, you can't argue with the results people to this day still bring up the british invasion stuff to me so it you know it, it got over and, and that's ultimately is, is the objective so who am I to, to say like, oh, it was pigeonholed and blah, blah, blah. Because now I look back at it and go, I really enjoyed that run. And and, and it, there's nothing about it I would have changed to a degree. And oh, let's also forget, let's also not forget that, uh, you know, it was a, a huge improvement from the character I had just been. I want to stop, start from the beginning. But there's one thing I have to clarify up front. First yeah. of all, I'm glad this happened, bro, because I... I want I wanted to bring you on the show and I was even following you for a while trying to get you to follow me back. I didn't know how to get a hold of you. Bro. Yeah, bro, now listen, let let me say this. When I heard the comment that you made uh, that, you know, Vince said um Vince said, uh, "Oh, what do you you know, what do you what are you talking about? You're a Brit, you'll never be champion." My first knee-jerk reaction was, "I never said that because I can't remember saying it." But then I said to myself, wait a minute, man. This is Magnus saying it. This is a straight-up guy. This is, this is not a, a, a wrestler that lies. And I said, so, so I'm sure that I said it. But I'm also, I'm sure that I said it as a joke and in jest. Bro, you don't think I, like, was serious with that, do you? No, and, and, and you know, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm sorry that it was – it became the thing that they shone a light on. And I should know better by now because I've got into hot water before by making one like throwaway remark and, and trusting the guys, you know, who have interviewed me or, or who have then paraphrased it, that they're not going to make that the focal point. And I should know better by now, but like, honestly, I mean, you, if you, if you listen to the audio, I don't know if you did or not, but like, it was such a throwaway remark. Like it was just something that popped into my head and I thought, Oh, that's interesting. Like that'll be a funny story to tell because it, you were you're you're if people who don't know you or who, who only know the the public kind of been through so persona that you sort of put out even even now you know you, you if, if someone said to me hey describe like what vince is like backstage or whatever I, most of the time I say he's pretty aloof you know like you it's not like you're walking around like like say a, an eric bishop or something like you know mr important like stay away from me like you're you know you're too low on the totem pole to talk to me kind of thing or you know you were very much like the other way kind of like like airy loose you know kind of like hey what's going on but you know but so sort of guarded but not like like that's i think you and jeff get along well because jeff's kind of like that too like he's approachable but at the same time like he's a master of uh of, of you know avoiding things if he needs to and i mean that as a compliment but there would be times where, you know, and this is as a guy who I'm, I'm 29, you know, and I was like, when, when we were working together at the, you know, the most sort of fervently, I was like, what, 22, 23? Young, yeah, like, very young. I was 
you know, I was, I was immature and I was very highly strung and like, and desperate to, to get a foothold and stay, stay in the United States, keep, you know, stay on my job, like get, you know, make more money, kind of progress with my career. And it was one of those things where I, it was, you know, I would have these regular conversations with you where. Well, but like, none of them were over three minutes yeah. though. Let's get that clear. None of them were over three minutes. No, as you they stated, weren't. As you stated. They weren't. I knew I had to give you that jab. I just had to stop. But you know, Max, like, this is what I want to say about you. First of all, let me make this perfectly clear. I, and this, I'm not just saying that. Bro, I, I really loved all the British guys that I work with. And that's before, now I love them even more because I was there three times. But I'll tell you what I loved about them. This is the God honest truth. First of all, bro, because I have you know the thick New York accent. I always love the British accent. That's number one because it's very classy. It's very refined. But here's what I loved about you. Bro, I tell, I, I've said this all the time. Doug Williams, one of my all-time favorite guys. I've had him on the show. I used to tell the guy I loved him when I worked with him. I got to form a little relationship with Rockstar Spud. I wish I would have got to work with him, but I didn't. But the one thing, here's what stands out about the British wrestlers. Even though, bro, you were 22, 23 years old when we worked a lot together, you guys were always the most respectful athletes. I've ever worked with. Now, I'm sure that's an England thing. I mean, always, bro, when you were unhappy about something, you never had an attitude. You never had a chip on your shoulder. You would approach me, you know, like a gentleman. You would file your grievances and always very, very professional. So, I mean, I hope you understand that, that, you know, with all the guys that I worked with that were never unhappy one of the reasons why I did gravitate to you was because you were always so professional, even at that young age. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I have always tried to, to do that. And again, that was one of the things jumping forward that sort of pushed me on my decision to, to, to leave TNA because I, in my mind, I still maintained that approach, you know, even as the world champion. And even after huge milestones for me, like Sting doing the honors for me in the middle of the ring, I still maintained like the where if I did have something, I'd be like, hey, can we go and have a, you know, a private chat somewhere? It was never like, hey, like, well, you know, come back and throw a big temper tantrum and stuff like that. And, and, and when I'll tell you that the thing that really hurt my feelings and it shouldn't have done because I shouldn't have given it the, the credibility that, that and, and we'll talk about this later. I think everyone in everyone in wrestling is giving the Internet news sites way too much credibility and paying way much too much attention to them but it did hurt my feelings when when uh i think it was wade keller and a few others started sort of putting out this thing out there that oh you know he's he's upsetting a lot of people backstage and he's upset the veterans because he doesn't talk to the you know and and i couldn't and i, I was so hurt because i knew it was a deliberate sabotage yeah like, that's um, that's i know I, who it was yeah and everyone who was there knows who it was i'm not going to say who it was but it was it was so obvious that it was like a hatchet job on me magnus just, let's go like, let's go to let's go to the beginning was. let's let's go to i want to start at the beginning we're going to talk about all this because yeah. magnus i want to tell you too you don't even know this and i'm going to tell you this i first started working as the secret consultant in your match with sting and right. the first script gaboric sent me was that and, you know, they had told me, John had set me up telling me, Magnus is going to be the guy, Magnus is going to be the guy, Magnus is going to be the guy. They sent me the script. They had Sting going over in the match. I so I was like, wait, I, I, bro, keep in mind it was my first pay-per-view back. Right. So I said, John, with all due respect, if Magnus is the guy, how the heck is he doing the job to Sting? You got to – we're going to get to that in a minute. I want to well, get and, to the and beginning. And I'll say this, Sting, Sting also said that. Yeah, I know he did because he told me later on. He told me that. He told me. Bro, let, let's get to the beginning. I want to talk about the beginning, right? I, I want this to be about our relationship, me and you, from the beginning. Now, you first have to understand Magnus is, is first introduced through me by the boss, Dixie Carter, okay? 
And, bro, let me tell you. See, the, I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory, Magnus, because I think I'm going to understand you a little bit better. I think you're going to understand the entire situation a little bit better when we're done. Um, now, bro, Magnus was like Dixie's find. All she told, I saw, I could tell you this story. I've heard it a million times. I saw him in the pages of the magazine. Well, let, let's call spade a spade, bro. She saw you in the pe in the pages of the magazine, and she thought you were a hot piece of man meat. That like that's where it started. Let, let's be honest, Magnus. Okay, can she can saw the body. Go ahead. Can we just go ahead and agree that you won't use the phrase "hot piece of man meat"? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, bro. I won't use the phrase. But let bro, let's face it. She she saw the picture. She saw the body. She yep. saw the blue eyes. The whole package. You know the 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 hormones went went ballistic with this woman. Okay, so. Bro, at that point, keep this in mind now, Magnus is her guy. She found him. She found him. Now, bro, put this into play now because I want to start at the very beginning with you. Dixie Carter and Jeff Jarrett never got along. Never got along. I was in the middle of the fire for the whole time. So now right off the bat, bro, you got to understand, you have this woman putting over this guy we don't even know. And now you have Jeff, who's getting it just as much as I am, and Jeff and Dixie are having problems to begin with. So I hate to say this, Magnus, I had the same conversation with Storm about a, a couple weeks ago. I am so at fault for this, and, and I hate that I did this, but I think it's human nature. So this is where my relationship with you really started. I use Storm as, a, as an example. When I first met Storm and Harris, I didn't know them from a hole in the wall. Bro, freaking Bob Ryder was shoving them down my throat every second. I was almost, I, 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 I literally said to Bob at one point, are you dating these guys? Like, is this is there something more? Here? But bro, here's what happens, Magnus. And I, I was so guilty of this, and I was wrong. When somebody, when you're in creative and somebody just relentlessly starts forcing a talent down your throat, you just have the tendency to immediately do the opposite. Right. Do you understand? And that is so wrong on so many levels, but that's the truth. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? I made, I made that observation about you. Um... Probably about two years in, maybe maybe less. I think like one of the things I took pride in, in, in I think one of the reasons I stuck around because I was let's let's call a spade a spade. I was the shits. Like I wasn't good when I first got there. I wasn't good enough in the ring. I, and also coming off the fact that I was I was already inexperienced, but I was a wrestler. Some people don't real. Some people think that I was just on this gladiator show and then just got hired. Right. That's not true. I was a full time wrestler. And but, you had your and you even had your first match with Doug, if I'm correct, right? I, Singles match, yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And, and um, but I, I had also come off a long uh, sort of hiatus from wrestling because of gladiators. I wasn't allowed to wrestle during that, you know, during shooting of that because they didn't want me to get hurt. And then I had just come off of acting in a play. So, you know, and I, the, the, the way it had been laid out to me originally was it was going to be, I don't know if you remember this, but they, I, so Dixie basically, I'm sure this is, you know, it's not, it's not, it's an unusual situation, but um, the, the magazine thing is, is true in the sense that Dixie, the, AJ was on the cover of that, that issue of FSM. And I still write for them every month to this day. Um, but AJ was, and that was the first time a TNA guy had been on the cover. It would always been WWE guys. And this was the first time TNA had been on the cover, which was a big milestone represented like TNA really starting to get a good grip in the UK marketplace. So Dixie was, you know, very, um, you know, hands-on with that magazine, and rightfully so. James, the editor at the time, then just reached out to me and said, hey, just FYI, like Dixie read your, you know, your feature and sort of asked if you would, wouldn't mind, you know, put, being put in touch. And I said, sure, you know, absolutely. And within two emails, Dixie's like, when, you know, when, when could you start? And I just sort of went, well... Uh, I have this, this, and this, and this, and, you know, so I, I could start in the new year. She's like, perfect, you know, starting time for the UK tour. And I'm immediately thinking, like, geez, like, you know, 
they don't i'm so inexperienced they want my first matches to be like on the biggest live events they have and you know i i want like i wanted to do it but at the same time i knew the same the same as why when people said to me back then they'd be like how come you never went to a wwe tryout so i go because i wasn't good enough mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like i don't want to go to a tryout just to be you know just for them to then make a note like not ready you know or to be a security guy or anything and i'm not disparaging anyone who does that i just didn't want that for me so and then i was getting ready to do I think it was just about finished wrapping up the second season of, of the show. And I got a thing from Terry Taylor saying like, could you make it to the pay-per-view, like the December pay-per-view? And it was like, they were going to have me like be a, do a run in, in like the, the main event and be like this. And, and even then uh, with having no experience whatsoever and no place to have an opinion, I was thinking, that's not going to get over one bit. Like, no one knows who I am. Like, why would I interfere in? It was like Kurt and Mick. Fo I think in the end they ended up doing it with Rhino, but I can't remember what it was. So my very first mistake, um, people say, oh, Vince Dutt doesn't say he made any mistakes, which is such a freaking myth. Dixie shoving you down my throat. And Jeff's too, keep in mind, already were like, here's yeah. number two. I never met you, didn't get a chance to talk to you, nothing. They, uh, she, you know, she wants you to be on TV right away. We got to come up with a character. All I know, bro, is you were on this Gladiator show. Right. So here's mistake number two, Magnus. In my mind, here's what I'm thinking. Okay, all I know, all I know is he's on this Gladiator show. He's a big guy. He's an impressive guy. Let's make him a modern day Gladiator now. When I say modern day gladiator to you, in the mind of Vince Russo, I'm thinking like Lord Humongous. I'm thinking you've got this great costume. You got, you know, the bullets across the shoulder. You know, I mean, straight out of Mad Max. I'm thinking WWE. Whereas if I said we want this guy to be a modern day gladiator, this is what he's going to look like. I made the mistake of not either realizing or wanting to realize, okay, I'm dealing with TNA. There, there's no creative services. There's nobody to make this costume the right way. The way I'm thinking of it, it's going to cost a lot of money. All, all that did not go through my brain. So, so what happens, bro? We do Brutus Magnus, and the first time you show up, the outfit literally looked like a kid's outfit that you could have bought at Kmart. Right. That was my bad because I should have known what's in my, in my mind and what TNA was capable of doing man-wise and money-wise. It was going to look the way it looked. I should have known that, bro. You know, everyone backstage now wants, they want too much of the credit. And, and you know, you are interested in your comment on that because I kind of include you a little bit in that side of things because I, I heard an interview you gave where you talked about writing in secret. And believe me, I want to touch on that some more too. But where you kind of said you felt a little bit insulted that they wanted to keep it a secret. But in my mind, I was thinking... If you're the writer of the show, it, for the for the sake of the audience and the sake of the sort of suspension of disbelief for the product, you really don't want to know who's who's responsible for it because then it adds a different element and you can't invest in the characters. I felt it as a um, I felt it as an insult because to me, and I think you can vouch to this, you know, a big part of my job was communicating with the talent. I could not do that in secret. So like a, a such a huge element of my job was taken away because I could not get on the phone with you right. and say, you know, Nick, you're having this match with Sting. This is I nobody could know I was working that. Right. Working with talent was such a big part of me and who I was that my God, bro, honestly, I I I, I just assume not even 
work as a consultant if I can't communicate with the talent. So yeah. I hear exactly what you're saying, bro, but it was never a a credit type of thing. It was, man, if you're going to hire me as a consultant, there are things I need to do. If yeah. I can have no communication with the talent, you're, you're taking away at least 50% of my job. Yeah, and, and, and in, in fairness to that point, you know, I, I would have said that at that period, John Gerberich was, I, you know, I have my opinions about his qualifications, and, you know, and I don't think that he's done a very good job and I don't think he's very experienced. And he, the, the communication was a huge issue yeah. because he, he, within this, I've never seen anyone, and bearing in mind, you know, I, I was, in my run, I saw like a revolving door of who was in charge, right? It was like yep, four of course. Five different people. And every single time that happened, I had to go back to the bottom of the packing order. I had to prove myself all over again. Yep. Have the same discussions about who I was and what I had done. No, I wasn't. No, I was a wrestler before I was on Gladiators and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I have never, out of all of them, you know, saw a quicker descent into, like, I'm the boss, like, I don't have time for you, like, I'm the big Magnus, dude. I could tell you, when he brought me on as a consultant, first of all, the only reason I got hired as a consultant was because Dixie wanted it. Right. That's number one. Number two, the minute he brought me on as a consultant, bro, I could tell you, you know how like you quickly learned how things were backstage? Within three weeks of being around him and having conversations with him, it was clear to me that John Gaborik creatively in his mind – he knew more than Vince Russo would ever know when it came to writing a show. Now, keep in mind, you could say whatever you want about Vince Russo, but I got my education working with the best in the business, five years of that being connected to Vince's hip. Right. Within three weeks, John Gaborik knew more than I would ever know about creative, and it was clear to me this guy wanted to be the boss he yeah. doesn't want to be challenged by anybody, certainly anybody who knows more than him. Thus, Dave Lagana, Matt Conway, in, in the bushes, minions doing his work. I don't. There's other things I want to talk about with you because there's things, bro, you don't even know. Okay. Yeah, I'm cur I'm. I'm. I'm you, honest, Vince. I'm genuinely like curious about it because I'll tell okay. you, that I heard. I heard the, the sort of rumblings, right? There was like the occasional kind of, I heard that like some, you know, they, they, they might be bringing Vince back or whatever. But it was, it was never any more than that. And you're totally right about Lagana and Conway. I like Matt Conway. Like I really like it. He's a great guy. But those two guys are trees in, the, in a field. They well, just, yeah, you know, Magnus, it's like you said, bro. I'm with you a thousand percent. Like, you know, you think there's too much of guys wanting to be credit, wanting to take credit, wanting to take credit. And I don't disagree with that, bro. I, I really don't. But I think on the other side of the coin, you can't be a writer or a producer in wrestling and hide in the weeds. Because, bro, you, you have to take responsibility. You got to okay. say, yeah, I effed up or, yeah, that was good. But yeah, yeah. but I'm referring more to like in public, like to the fans, not not so much to the talent. I, I got mean, more I as got far you. as I like to me, you know, Dave Lagana being on Twitter and having like X amount of thousands of followers and like having his profile picture as him and Rockstar Spud, like that's an issue to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I'm like, you're... Uh, this is, is an interesting story for you. Um, so you said you came on in like October of 2013, right? So, so this was this was in the summer of 2013. They had me. I was, you know, I had, I, I, you know, I've been a heel most of my run there, and I was, I much more comfortable as a heel. Really liked working as a heel, but they had most of 2013. I was a babyface, and you know, it's scary being a babyface for a guy like me because it's, especially with that particular audience at the time, was becoming very hostile to anyone who had the look mm -hmm, mm -hmm. also the fact that i was a brit i'd been a heel for a long time you know as against guys like joe and stuff who were you know hugely over character baby faces well finally i start to actually get some steam as a baby face i'm starting to get over you know they had the aces and eights so they kind of had if you wanted to be i i figured like from a business standpoint if i want to be on the show i need to be a baby face so i you know and and, and it was a slow process and it was like it was a whole, it was like learning all over again to, you know, to have to work, to really learn how to work as a baby face. But I 
sat down with Sting a lot and picked his brain a lot about stuff because to me, you know, his ultimate babyface character. But I got, I started to get some momentum going with it. And then they had me join the main event mafia. And I remember being like filled with anxiety about it because I was thinking like, it was it was funny how it worked out because Sting independently uh, in a in a in a shoot you know shoot interview I hate that word but you know in a real interview had endorsed me publicly. Kurt in a in an interview had endorsed me publicly and Joe had also several times. So it kind of made so I don't know whether that influenced it but that was then you know then they said we're going to do the main event mafia and you're going to be in it and I remember thinking like. Do I, you know, I don't know if I have the credibility. Like I've never been champion. I've not, how many main events have I been in? You know what I mean? That weren't tags. And I was going like, uh, you know, and then they said, don't worry. Like the way they're going to, you know, we're going to portray it in the right way. You know, they're going to say the, the idea is that we're going to have past, present and future. I said, okay, okay, fine. Like, trust and it ended up doing very well. My first night in Vegas, you know, I'm standing there. I've gone out and spent like five grand on suits. You know, like got the whole deal and uh, went out and I was, you know, it was all about whether, the, how, what that, because they did the thing where Kurt stood in the ring and he's like, the fourth member is, and I remember thinking like, if this doesn't, if this doesn't get reaction, like I'm dead immediately, like dead in the war, but it got a decent pop and cut a good promo. Bruce, fi Bruce Richard finally gave me the time of day and we're off to the races, right? I come back from that segment, Dixie comes over to me and goes, hey, take a picture with me okay the next thing i know she's she mm. it, it's on twitter you know yeah and yeah. it's like she wasn't a character i don't know if she was i can't remember whether she was an on-screen character at the time or not but she but she tweets it and goes like so proud of this guy you know da 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 da, da. and i said like you can't do that yeah like yeah. i said i get that i get that you know it's that you know that's the show and this is real which i hate by the way I, I hate that part of wrestling now like oh here are these heels that we want you to hate on tv oh but by the way look at this cool video of them doing all this charity work oh yeah i bro i went ballistic i mean the, the wwe they send they send heels to children's hospitals and i'm like you mean to tell me there are no there are, there are no baby faces on the right. i so i hear you on that I right and, i mean that's you know that's not an indictment of wwe it's just yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah 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 but i said to her like don't you understand like how damaging that is to me? Like I, I'm going to struggle so much to get over already because I'm, I'm already seen as like your guy. They've finally like forgiven me for that. I'm like getting over by myself. I tag with Joe and work with Joe and all that kind of stuff. And then like the first Ma thing you do is go like, Hey, remember Magnus, let me stop you right there. Wasn't it very frustrating to you at that point that she still didn't, get it that that was the frustration i always used to have with her you know magnus we're like after a while i was like okay dixie you, you've been around long enough you should get it now you should understand you should know when eric bischoff's working you you should know when hulk you after a certain period of time now you should be smart enough to the business like you said bro you're over in england things are done totally differently you come over here it's a different environment you had to learn quickly hold wait a minute it's a different game over here my frustration with her is she she never got it and that's the perfect example bro how could she not know after everything you'd been through that that was going to work against you yeah and and, and listen I, i've tried very hard since i left and i still maintain a very good relation with dixie and i'm very grateful to her she you know they paid me well um i had a, a i had a great contract up until the end you know uh, um and and bob right you know you, you mentioned bob earlier and that was another thing was that i think in the beginning i was concerned right but then hogan and eric came along and like they didn't even know i existed and then jeff i don't know i don't know where you know when when he changed his mind on me or, or what, but you know, Jeff then got the, we had the India thing. We had Rinka King in India <laughs> and Jeff comes to me and says, I want you to come and do this. Instantly. I want to make you the guy over there. Cause I want to prove to them that like, because it, it was the, it, we used to joke about this. A lot of the boys, like the guys who, who really got it, like the Bobby Roods, the abysses, Jeff Dutch, when he was still there, we used to joke about the fact that like, 
Like they used to say shit like, hey, when you didn't know what you were doing, you were on TV every week. And now that you get it, they take you off, you know, like and, and that was, perfect, you know, because back Bro, then, can, kind of like shiny new toy, you know, like can we dog. can we can we talk about that? Yeah. Okay, yeah, let, let, let me, and I hate to interrupt you, bro, there is so much I want to cover with you. I literally could have you on for three hours, but I know I can't. Uh, okay, l I, I want to go, so bro, so here, here's what happened. So we do the Brutus thing, the outfit, the whole nine yards, we covered that. Okay, yep. here's what starts happening now. Your Dixie's guy, Jeff and Dixie are doing this, doing this, doing this, okay? In the meantime, like, I get to know you. And everything I've just said about you, listen, bro, this guy, he's respectful, he looks great, uh, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's not like the others, let me just put it to you that way. I had I had my hands full, bro, with the 20-something-year-old guys who knew more than I would ever know. You weren't one of them, okay? So now, he, this is what I start doing, bro. I think here's where my separation with some of the boys comes, Okay. I know the situation with Dixie. I know the situation with Jeff. On top of that, Magnus, what I get is when I'm in a production meeting and some of the wrestlers who are agents, you know, former wrestlers, you know, guys including Jeff and people like that, when they start criticizing your work and you even, you know, admit it at the beginning, you're green, when they start criticizing your work, that's where me, Vince Russo, the writer, I can't say anything. Right. I'm not a wrestler. I've, you know, I don't claim to be. So when the wrestlers start talking about somebody's work, I can't say anything. That's not my place. Right. But with all this going on, here's how my mind works. My mind works as Vince maneuver through the BS and just get the guy on TV. Because with me, Magnus, this is a business. And it's not about, you know, are you the top baby face or are you the top heel? Are you in the top feud or are you in the bottom feud? To me, as a business, Nick Aldis wants to get his brand on television. Even if it's five minutes doing a job, get them on TV. So like that used to be my discussion with a lot of the guys, bro, you're on TV. Your right. your brand is on TV. You're in front of X amount of people every week. Take that time to get yourself over. Don't worry about I'm not getting a push. I'm not the top guy. I'm not this. You're on TV. That's how I always looked at it from a business point of view, okay? And I definitely didn't understand that until much later down the okay. road. So now, let, let, let me tell bro, you don't notice. I'm telling you, you don't notice. And my right hand up to God, and listen, Nick, I don't, I don't say anything. When I say something controversial, I invite the people on my show. I will say that to you. I will say it with you here. There is nothing that I would, I would say behind your back. This happened, and if you want to debate it, come on my show and debate it. Right. I remember it as it was clear as day. Now, first of all, people don't understand, Nick. Let me say this. This is the part that frustrates me, and I think you'll understand this, okay? People don't understand. I was in TNA for about 10 years. Nick, for about eight weeks out of those 10 years... I was actually in charge of creative for about eight weeks. Jeff was creative. Right. So now I would sit there and I would pitch stuff all day long because Jeff's not Jeff's not good at the creative things. He's better at big picture. But at the end of the day, Jeff made the decision with, you know, what talent was going to be over and what talent wasn't going to. I just pitched the story ideas. Then Jeff gets sent home. Two months later, Bischoff and Hogan are there. Bischoff's a part of the creative. It's the whole thing all over again. So the only time I had control was when Jeff left because of Karen and before Hogan and Bischoff came in, which was about two months. So the yeah. thing that blows me away is of all the steam I have with uh, Heat, with people from TNA, first of all, I was only in charge for eight weeks. It was either Jeff or I was either working with Eric and Hulk and their opinion. 
I get all the heat, Nick, because I was the guy out there. I was the guy that was aloof. I had well, no. And it's easy to and it's easy to put the heat. On. You're you're it's. I mean, you you're almost a metaphor for TNA in a lot of ways, where it's like it, it's really it's really easy to criticize TNA, like and it's and and it becomes sort of fashionable to do so. And I think the same happened with you, and I think unfairly, you know, like I, I'm not, you know, there there were times where some of the stuff you came up with was zany, and I couldn't wrap my head around it. But at the same time, it's like I also understood that, like. I, and this is that Kevin Nash said so. I you probably remember this, but like Nash was like the first guy to like really take me under his wing, and like and I you know and he would and he was like one of the first guys sort of real guys with stroke who really was an advocate for me. But he he would say like you know the ironic thing is that we all call it the wrestling business, but as soon as you treat it like one, you get tons of heat. And but I I always adopted that mentality like treat it like a business. No matter, you know, and and listen, I'm a guy. I made the I made the 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 championship belts out of wrapping paper and cardboard when I was a kid. I made tables I could slam my brother through. I did all that, but at the same time, like now now you know, in as a profession, and I've made a full time living at it for ten years. I you know I do treat it like a business, or at least try to for the yeah. most part. And I and I remember, you know, you would always say, "Listen, guys, I know that some of this stuff." might seem a little stupid and it might be you know it might not be wrestling 101 but the fact is is it rates better and mm -hmm. more so in tna than in wwe the tv was the lifeblood of the company nobody i don't even the fans who who are quote unquote smart to the business have no idea how vulnerable tna's business model was and now it's been proven because you know, their spike TV revenue accounted for such an enormous majority of their their revenue. So it was like, you have to keep them happy. So if something rates better, of course, they're going to want more of it. Do you remember when we did the big, like, brawl that happened all over Universal? It was, where, like, I, I, and, I think it was Joe and Kurt. It was like the whole show? It, no, no, it, it was like, the it was, the, it was World Elite, Main Event Mafia, uh, beer money. It was basically like all of the main sort of storylines all ended up in this. It was started off as just some sort of throwaway kind of tag, yeah. and then it just descended into this thing. And suddenly here and and the and it was really innovative. You know, like you had stuff shot with like some of it was shot like with security camera mm -hmm. style, mm -hmm. and then we had like they brought a burned out old car that like me and James like slammed each other through, and you know, and there was people all over. The Dudleys were in it. Like there was people, and it was, and it it rated the highest of course that, it did like a 1.4 yeah and i remember that because shortly after that that was like mid 2009 shortly after that there was a big meeting where like terry said like we you know the the it's the highest ratings we've had on spike it's climbed significant you know it's climbed consistently and the company is officially making a profit remember that after we did that segment with all with everybody brought, there was like three more in the space of two months and i remember going to you and saying like you probably don't remember this because it was a real throwaway conversation but i remember going like oh you know another uh, another big like you know 20 person brought and you and you literally like went that's what spike want like if spike you know spikes like spike people don't realize this that like spike every now and then would come in and say we want this, and it was like the hand of the Pope. You know, it was just like, okay, you know. We'll yeah, well, it was also too, bro. But that—that that, that was me as well, because, bro, I've said this all along. Nobody used to look at ratings more closely than me, and it was never about what I wanted and what I liked. I solely went by the numbers. If yeah. something was getting over, we, you know, and and it's drawing the most eyeballs. It wasn't about whether or not I liked it. We, right. That's a road. But also, bro, like with that being said too, like I was not the guy, and I tell this story because, bro, this got me years and years and years of heat with Joe. And and, and I didn't find out till after I left TNA. But like, bro, I wasn't the guy that if somebody came up with an idea and it wasn't mine and I disagreed with the idea, 
I wasn't the guy that went to talent and buried the guy whose idea it was. We were a team. I was just as responsible for anybody else. So I will say it now. And, and, and if he wants to deny it and come on this show and deny it to my face, bro, you, you are more than welcome. Okay, I will say it now. When Eric Bischoff pitched to me and Conway about Samoa Joe being kidnapped and thrown in a van, I looked at Bischoff like, bro, you're nuts. The whole story was Bischoff claimed that he could get Jimmy Fly, Jimmy Snooker, who was behind it, and he was going to train Joe. Okay, now, that was 100% Eric's... Bro, Conway was the third man there. Anybody could ask Conway, and I, I, I objected, objected, but, bro, it gets to the point sometimes where all right, I'm not going to have a full-fledged argument with Eric. I'm waving the white flag. That's what people think. Everything was my idea. Right, right. Okay, bro, we did that, okay? For years and years and years... Joe held that against me right. because in his mind, that killed his career. And, and, and I finally told him when I was out of TNA, I said, Joe, I said, that wasn't my idea. And at that point in time, I wasn't going to bury Eric because we were all in creative together. But yeah. the fact that he assumed it was me because I laid it out to him because Hogan and Bischoff would leave the building all day long and not come back till before the show started. Just the fact that I laid it out to Joe, it was my idea, and he blamed me for that for years. Yeah, I remember. I remember that angle, and because then shortly after that, wasn't that when he came back and he hung Davari upside down and had the machete? Something, bro. Yeah, but, and, and, but, yeah. but here's my but but so like that. That's my point. I was the guy out there. I was the guy in the trenches, and therefore I got blamed for a lot of things. When literally eight months, the book was mine, bro. I swear to God, this is what happened with you. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I don't know if you know this story, bro. The very first time you met Eric Bischoff, it was me, you, and him. And I may have made the introduction, okay? The three of us were there. We had a conversation, okay, bro? When you walked away from the conversation, Eric turned around to me and said, I don't like that guy. He's a guy that you can't trust. This My right hand to my children, bro. If Eric Bischoff wants to come on the show, come on the show. That's a guy you can't trust. I said, why, Eric? He said, because the whole time the three of us were there talking, he couldn't look me in the eye. And I said, I said, Eric, I said, I know Magnus. He's a stand-up guy. There's a big part of Magnus that is shy. I said, bro, you're a very intimidating guy. I said, when people meet you for the first time, it's very intimidating. I said, I promise you he meant nothing by that. He yeah. turned around to me. Well, he turned around to me. He goes, well, he goes, I don't care. I don't like him. Now, bro, from that moment on, any time your name is brought up, this is what is in Eric Bischoff's mind. So right. when, when I'm sitting there creatively, and I know you've got to make money like everybody else, the only way you're going to make money is to get on the show, even if it's an insignificant part to have you on the show. But, bro, that happened. And, and, yeah. and, and that's the thing, bro. It's like I would get heat for everything, and it was like, bro, I was just the guy that was always there. Yeah, I understand. It, okay, I actually – I did hear a version of that. I didn't – I didn't – you know, I, I don't recall that, but I do remember being slightly, slightly intimidated and wary of Eric, but also slightly kind of 
standoffish, which was my fault. Like I, I remember I be having a little bit of resentment because if you if you recall when they did the Monday night impact, um, they advertised uh, us and beer money as one of the featured matches. And then none of us were actually there. We weren't even booked, like we weren't booked, but they advertised us. So in our minds, we all went, so you, you'll you advertise us to help try and like get a rating or to help try and get some eyeballs or whatever, supposedly. And then the first thing they did was the, you know, tear up the format thing. So just, I mean, indirectly, just like buried all of us, you know, for, with, without having it even met us at that point. So I was already like harboring like a little bit of like, I wasn't going to show up and, and kiss his ass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If it, 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 you know, it was misinterpreted, fine. But we did have a conversation much further down the road where I basically started to realize like, it's now or never. Like, I'm going to confront this guy and, and like get the truth out of him. Cause he could, I could tell, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's one of the most unapproachable, mm -hmm. like in terms of body language and the way he carries himself mm -hmm. in the whole, I've ever met in any walk of life. Mm -hmm. I finally corner him and go, what's the deal? Like, what is it with me that doesn't, that doesn't work for you? And he goes, all right, fine. You want to hear that? Here it is. And he goes, blah, blah, blah. And he, you think you're better than everyone else. You walk around like, you know, you walk around like, like you're, uh, you know, you don't talk to people and you're very unapproachable. And I just went, are you talking about me or you? <laughs> like, cause it sounds like you're describing yourself. I was like, you are the most unapproachable person I've ever met. And then this was, this was the beginning of when I started to realize like how fucked everything is. Sorry for the language. He goes, well, I read this interview you gave on like so-and-so.com recently, which bearing in mind was, I was at a convention doing a signing and one of these guys came up with one of these gimmicks. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was hardly a, you know, a significant thing. And he goes, where they said, if they asked you if you'd ever go to WWE and you said yes, I go, well, what the fuck do you want me to say? You know, I said, like, what's wrong? I just go like, OK, well, first of all, they're the industry leader. Um, anyone who works in any industry, if they're asked, would they consider working for the industry leader? You, of course, would say, yes, I would consider it. Mm hmm. I said, I also said that as far as I'm aware, that's, you know, that's not really enough. That's not really up for discussion. I'm under contract and I'm loyal to whoever I'm under contract to. I also said that Dixie's given me a lot of opportunities when I, which I didn't necessarily deserve at the time, provided me a nice living and I'm loyal to that person while I'm under contract to that person End the story. And I said, what the fuck would I have any reason to be loyal to you for when I walk around, you act like I don't fucking exist. Mm -hmm. And he and like I just let him have it because I thought you know what like what's what's there to lose at this point. And it was the next day. Um, I think it was Tommy Dreamer came up to me and said, "Hey, Eric was really uh, putting you over in the meeting yesterday. Like he really like they they want to do more with you or whatever." So I don't know what you did. And I was just like, well, "This is so toxic. Like this is so mm -hmm. stupid. Like and, you know, oh I get off on people confronting me." And all I could think of was that I had heard that same story about Vince McMahon. Like I'd heard that same kind of scenario about Vince McMahon once or twice. But here's the thing, Vince, I didn't sit there and go like, oh, cool. Like that's what you have to do. I just remember thinking like Eric is obviously such a mark for Vince that he's just deliberately like trying to do the same thing. Cause he wants these same kind of stories and stuff. Yeah. Like, am I way off base with that? No. Bro, do you know, bro, the, the ripping up, uh, up of the script do you know, bro? See, bro, this is how effed up it is, and this is why I love Dixie as a person, as a businesswoman. She's the shits. Period. I I'm sorry. I love her as a human being. She's in the wrong business. When, when, first of all, bro, she wanted to hire Hulk Hogan. Of course, they worked her in. Hulk doesn't come in without Eric. Okay. So, bro, how creative started was Eric was just supposed to be involved on Hulk stuff because, you know, Hulk, they gave him creative control, which I told them they were nuts. They gave him creative control. So Eric is just involved with Hulk stuff. Of course, Dixie being Dixie, next thing I know, she has whatever conversation she has with Eric. Next thing I know, bro, he's a full-fledged part of the creative team. 
Okay, but keep in mind, as a part of creative team, me, Ed Ferrara, and Conway are doing all the grunt work. He's yeah. he's 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 approving what's good and what's not good. But bro, when you talk about ripping up the script, the very first day in the meeting with Ferrara and Conway, like I said, there are two other people that can vouch for this. He basically said, just to set the record straight. TNA has not existed until today. Everything that you guys did up to this point did not matter and literally ripped up the script that we had. And like the three of us looked at each other, but again, like who do you, who do you put the heat on, bro? Do you put the heat on Eric Bischoff who is a egomaniac, power-hungry mongrel or do you put the heat on the person that gives them that power? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what it comes down to, you know? It's, it's ironic to me that he would say that when, at that point, the only reason they came in was because TNA was starting to be on the radar. Right. Like, the only reason they came in at that point was because that we were starting to average 1.3s and 1.4s at a time where... I don't know the exact number, but it wasn't that far off what SmackDown was rating. Bro, we we had the number up too because again, I, I I still get buried for all of TNA, and I'm like, bro, you everybody can bury me all they want because I let numbers speak, not what people think. Bro, we had we had TNA up to over two million people a week. Yeah, I remember that because, well, you know that that was, I well, I fortunately, I mean, came in right like my sort of debut and that, that that 2009 was like the best year for tna it was the yeah. best year they ever had and so i was that was my first year in in, in the yeah. company where i sort of and that was and then 2010 i did nothing so right. i'll never forget bro the minute jeff went home matt and i were like okay let's put the let's put the effort and the spotlight on the tna guys now the first thing we did was put the belt on aj we put the belt on aj two months later Bischoff and Hogan, the Nasty Boys are in, Hall and Sean Waltman are in, and it never rebounded from that. But again, who do you put the heat on, them or the person who made the decision to bring them in the company? And, and, and I tell people all the time, you know, bro, my, my beef with Eric is, and I say this all the time, I don't like the way he treated people. It's yeah. it's that simple. I I I saw him treat some people pretty pretty bad. Yeah. He treated me pretty bad at times, and and I I I don't like the way he treats people. I mean, it's it's that simple. And, yeah, and I and and I, I had the same um, opinion about John Gaburik, honestly. Yeah, you know, bro. I, let, 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 let's jump to that period. Let's jump to that yeah. period because, bro, they bring me in creatively now. You know, bro, I went home. Because, you know, bro, if you knew how creative was, this is how creative was being done at the end, Magnus, to give you a little idea. Me and Conway would do all the grunt work. We'd write the creative. Okay, Eric was never involved in that. At that point, we'd have to send all creative to Eric, okay? Bro, th imagine this. Also, let's put this in his proper perspective, bro. I was the guy at WCW. I was the guy at WWE that was writing when we reversed the ratings with WCW. Let let let's like let let's set history first. So Eric had this company on a roll. Vince brings me in as a writer. Vince and I are writing the show. The birth of the Attitude Era. All of a sudden, we kick their ass. Eric Bischoff is out of a job. Okay now. Under the guise of Dixie Carter, okay, now Vince Russo is writing this show with young Matt Conway, and somehow, some way, we're sending the show to Eric Bischoff for his approval. Right. That, 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 that's, that's how Dixie could get worked. But, like, Max, I even went with that. I went, like, okay, fine. So here's what Eric would do he'd get our show, bro, literally red lines through our stuff okay with no no alternative of how to do it just I don't like this I don't like this I don't like this okay now me and Matt Conway would have to rework that show send it back to him and Eric would have to sign off on it at that point after Eric signed off on it 
It went to Pritchard. Now Pritchard put his guy. Now, bro, keep in mind, I was the guy that replaced Pritchard creatively. So, like, I'm third man on this totem pole. Not that I care, but the creative process got so ridiculous. I was like, you know, this this is not good for the company. This yeah. is so screwed up. I'm out. Bro, never in my wildest dreams did I think when I left the company, like within the next year, Jarrett would be gone, Pritchard would be gone, uh, uh, Bischoff would be gone. Never did I think that in a million years. So everybody's let go. I have contact with uh, with uh, I have contact with Dixie. She basically tells Gaborik, "I want Vince. You know, let's let's bring him in as a consultant." But he can't tell anybody. The first thing they tell me is, "You're the guy." This is before you won the title, bro. So I'm like, okay, you know, no problem. You, but you got to make Magnus strong. You got to set the table for Magnus. If he's going to be the guy, he's he's got to be the guy. That's why, bro, the first script they had you doing the job to Sting, and I'm like, then he's not your guy. Then Sting, I said, no. So I, Sting told me the story, too. Like, Gaborik approached him at the pay-per-view and said, well, Steve, you know, I had you going over, you know, in, in the pay-per-view, but... I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do based on what I said. And right. Steve said, absolutely, we got to put Magnus over. You know, there, there's no question about it. I remember. Yeah. I think, I think the thing was, was that I, like you said, like I said, I had worked pretty hard, I thought, to finally get, you know, to earn the people's trust and earn the audience's respect, like get, get away from the sort of, the sort of uh, shiny new toy kind of, Heat and the and and all that and be and and I was my own guy. The tag team with Joe and then the subsequent feud with Joe like really helped me out a ton, gave me a ton of credibility. And then we did the the the, uh, the tournament, the thingy, the Bound for Glory series. Mm -hmm. um, and it was me and AJ in the final. And I remember thinking to myself like, AJ has to go over in this because if I go over. It's just too much. It's just going to be a little too much, and everyone's going to get into that oh, he's getting a push thing. So luckily, you know, I, I mean, I mean, I would never, have, I would never have voiced it one way or the other anyway. But when Jeff called me and said, "Here's what we're, here's what we're doing," you and AJ, you know, you 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 beat Bobby in advance. AJ beats Aries in advances in that night, and then you wrestle each other, and it's like a, a you know. 50 50 and it's like aj just just catches it and you sit there and like as soon as it's over you sit there like hogan did after he lost to warrior and you look up like you know tears in your eyes if you can get them which i which i could like you look up there and you get that you know that moment where it's just like man i i worked so hard and i almost won and i said i love it because i knew that was was going to get me over mm -hmm. but you can only do that once mm -hmm. <laughs> and I knew that. So then when it came and then, and then that was what progressed to this. I love that whole, all that story arc I thought was fantastic. I loved it. I get to, you know, so then it was like, cause that was the whole idea was I then get frustrated and go like, what's the point? Blah, blah, blah. And Sting goes, here's the point is that I'm going to wrestle you at Bound for Glory. You know, you've earned it, right? Here's your chance. It's like a no brainer. Mm -hmm. What the finish has to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I can't say that. You know what I mean? Like if they had, if they, if I'd have got there and they said, "You put Sting over in one minute," I would have still done it. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that, I don't get paid to, to to write, and I, you know, but I will voice an opinion because I'm an independent contractor. They called me, well, Big called me, Gaburik called me, uh, God, like three days before the pay per view or something, and then and said like, "I need you to, I need you to do the favor for Sting." And then that's where you're going to snap and you're going to turn heel and like, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, and I just remember thinking like, well, okay, you know, I don't love it, but, and I just said, I said okay, but if, if that's, but, you know, sure. Like whatever you need, you know, I get, and I, and, you know, and, and obviously by the time I get to the pay-per-view, everyone's coming up to me and going like, oh, is that what they're doing? Like, oh man, like that's not the right thing to do. And, you know, but I just go like, I know it's okay. You know? Sting then says, hey, did you hear what they want to do for this match? And I said, yeah. I said, Steve, you know, you're, you're the man. Like, I, I do whatever you, you know what I mean? Like, I don't get, I don't get, I don't get a say. And he goes, well, 
I I don't care what you think. You're going over. Like, and this and this is I'm telling them right now that this is what we're doing. Um, and then on top of that, he goes, not only that, but I'm tapping out. Like, like you're submitting me in the middle. And like, like we'd ask Kurt to come and help us sort of do the match or whatever. And uh, Kurt was like, wow, like he wouldn't even do that for me, you know? <laughs> and I remember, you know, like it was, it was a significant, really yeah. significant thing. Yeah. And we had the match, like, I'll be honest, the people weren't with it as much as I had hoped, but I think they weren't quite because, because, the, you know, it, it was confusing kind of creative at that point because they had had me deliberately kind of set the table like I was going to turn. Right. So I feel like everyone was waiting for that turn and then it never happened. And then they did like the phony handshake and stuff, which I didn't like. But it was like that was the thing. It was, it was always this compromise, but it was never a compromise for the good of the show. Yeah. It was a compromise for the like size of whose nuts is bigger. You know what I mean? Where it's yes, like, I do. Yep. instead yep. of him going like, okay, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it all the way. You're going to pin him and then you guys do the embrace and Sting endorses you and the rest of it. No, no, it has to be Sting goes to shake your hand and you blow him off. Like, what? I remember just being like, that's so disrespectful Like to Sting. It's so disrespectful to the audience and it puts the wrong kind of heat on me. It's not heat on the character. It's just heat on like everything and they're just going to be like, this is bullshit right because i've sat there because everyone knows what a legends thing is no one who was a student of the game and who knew what they were doing would ever do that you know it like and i just you know and it was just stuff like that where i just would go like uh, you know but i could tell that it wasn't because of what you know he thought it was going somewhere business wise it was just because he had to have something yeah. and then we came back from that and sting goes Sting, I was right there, you know, I shook Sting's hand and said, I will, you know, this is the most, this is the biggest thing that anyone's ever done for me. Like, I, I, you know, you have no idea how grateful I am. Like, you know, I can't say enough. Sting goes, no, thank you for the match. Like, you, you deserve it. And then he turns to them, the, you know, Dixie Big and whoever was sat there at the table or whatever. And he just turns to them and goes, now you have to make sure that that means something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And walked away. And I just felt, I felt in that moment that like a switch flipped with Big, where it's like the heat went on me. You know what I mean? Like, let me, let me, let me, what to do, you know. Bro, let me stop you right there because I'm going to throw a beautiful comparison at you. Okay. So now, bro, you're the champion. Okay. They brought me in for a couple of secret meetings. I met with them once in Florida. I actually. Uh, I think I actually went to Nashville a couple of times or whatever, okay? And, bro, like, I'm sending notes on every show, okay? Bro, I'm putting you over, like, a million bucks. I think you're doing a phenomenal job. It's growing on you. It's it's working. This is growing. You in that suit look like a million bucks. You played the role. I loved it. Okay, this is the God honest truth, bro. And I'm gonna make a comparison in a minute here to to show you the difference, bro. They bring me to some meeting in Nashville, and I'm putting you over like a million bucks. Okay, but at that point, bro, there was something going on behind the scenes, like with you and Big. There there was some kind of heat something and bro as a consultant I was never in a position to say what's going on like what did he do why have you soured on him can right. why don't you have a conversation with him I, as a consultant I'm not in that position I'm just there creatively but their def something happened whether it was contractually or what where now all of a sudden the belt's on Magnus, we're building Magnus, he's getting comfortable in this role, I'm loving it, I'm thinking he's doing the best job he's ever done in his career, did, did something happen during that time? Yes, I'll tell you what it was. The night that I won the, the title on, from, uh, in the match with Jeff, the vacant belt or whatever, I got a concussion. I'd never had one before, never had one since. Right. I had this, and it was a rotten concussion. Like one of those where like I was on autopilot for the rest of the match. I looked like Jeff, bless his heart. Like at one point I kind of just went to a corner and sort of grabbed him and said like, 
Jeff, I hurt my head. I don't know, like, talk to me. I don't know what's going on. Wow. He was just like, wow. oh, man, like, okay. And, and bless his heart, like, we still went through the whole thing. No one could tell. And I think that was, you become a victim of your own success in TNA. And that's a, that's a statement I make more than once. We'll go back to that. But I think because I did such a good job of covering it up, or I say we did such a good job, I always felt like there was this element where Big didn't really buy it. Like, like he didn't think that I really got hurt. And I was thinking to myself, why would I pretend to, why would I pretend to get hurt on the night I won the world title? Like, right. what could I possibly be trying to avoid, right? We had we, we did the business, like I, I quite liked the business of that match. It was a bit interfery for my liking, but it was what I thought, you know, personally, you know, going back to that period. I always, I could never understand why it, we did that in December in Orlando when one month later we were going to be in, in the UK and I could have won the title as a baby face in the UK and then turned heel. I, didn't, I never understood that. But then that's, that's them. You know what I mean? Um, but Scott Demore was there because Scott was my agent. And I, I mean, like my business agent, right? So Scott would always come down if one of his guys was going to get the title. So Scott came down. And he was the first guy, like when I came back, like he could just see it in my eyes, like there was something not right. And he just goes, everybody get out the way, like sit down. And, and uh, another guy called Scott, actually, who was like the medic at the time, he's a good friend of mine and, and Bram's. He was another guy who was just like, oh, he's like, he's got a concussion. Everybody leave him alone, back away. But, and it was like, right away, they, he said, like, this, this is a concussion, you know, like it's, you know, I'm fine, right? Like I didn't. Like I did all the proper recovery and everything of, you know, I don't have, didn't have post concussion syndrome or anything like that, but it was, but it's a concussion, right? We take that stuff seriously now because we've learned. So of course, cause it's taped AJ's contract situation as, as it was, the plan was that I was, well, this is what big told me anyway. I can't, I don't trust the word he says, but he said, you know, he then later told me like that the, I, it was supposed to be me and AJ, you know, and I was supposed to just beat him. Right. I don't know whether that's true or not. You just, you never know with these guys. But obviously the first thing Big says to me, bearing in mind, I'm sitting there like, you know, loopy, right? Big goes to me, Nick, we've got a bit of a problem. And I said, what's that? And he goes, well, you know, AJ, as you know, is, is uh, not, you know, is, is, is not staying with us. Um, and we, you know, he's, tomorrow's his last day. We have to get this, we have to get that belt off him. And I'm sitting there thinking like, no, you don't. Like, we just did a match for the, like, for the vacant title. Like, why don't we just, you know, just, you, this isn't be the first time that you've just pretended something didn't happen. You know what I mean? That, mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking in my mind, right? It's not as important as you all think it is. But then he goes, well, you know, you're telling me that, that you've got a, you know, that you've got a concussion and they're telling, and the medics are telling me that like, you really shouldn't wrestle tomorrow and, you know, this and that. So, you know, that puts us in a bit of an awkward position. I said, yeah, I guess it does. Like you I said, well, I, I don't know why you're bringing this to me. You know, you make the decision, right? And then he goes, well, we might have to figure something out. Maybe something with, I don't know, EC3. And I sort of go like, well, that's odd. Like, that's a random name to, to throw in this mix. Like, he's not really over, you know what I mean? Like, but okay. And then I go, Big, are you suggesting that you might want me to drop the title again? Like, because I'm hurt? And he goes, no, 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 I'm not. No, no. I'm just suggesting we might have to do something. And he goes, but then he goes like this, real quiet, like, so no one can hear. He goes, but hey, who knows? Maybe between today and tomorrow, you make a full recovery. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm bro, that's, away. that's bad. You know, bro, you would think, I, I got to tell you something, Nick. Like, bro, listen. Vince Russo ain't Joe Athlete, okay? I had a match with Flair. I got a concussion. I suffered post-concussion syndrome. I've been there and I've done that. It was the worst thing I ever had to deal with in my life. That surprises me so much, just the fact that I know John played a lot of football. I mean, you huh? He had no regard for the... That's the what I'm case. saying. You think he would know from his football background that... I mean, bro, people don't understand. I can say this because I, I expect... There's nothing worse than a freaking concussion. It's it's not, you know, 
blowing out a knee or an elbow or a hip or a this. When you're just out of it, man, and you know something's different and you're, you're afraid, am I ever going to feel normal again? What happens if I get hit again? It's a freaking nightmare. I can't believe he wouldn't know that based on him playing football. Well, and that, and I don't, you know, it was a funny thing, but like, it, as I just remember just having, like, it gave me chills. You know what I mean? It was so, like such a rotten thing to say. And he goes, you know, because he's like, hey, who knows, maybe between now and tomorrow you make a full recovery, you know what I mean? And walks away, and I just, that was when I, you know, and then and then we had to do what we did with AJ and, for, you know, and just to sort of get through it, right? Because, like, I'm, like, I, you know, I, I, I'm not fit to, I'm not going to put AJ at risk. Right, but, of course, right, right. You know what I mean? So right, I go, like, right. you know, not going to happen, right? So then we did that awful thing with all the run-ins and the bullshit and blah, blah, blah. But it actually, you know, as usual, <laughs> victim of your own success and TNA, that rated well yeah so then of course here it comes again like hey we should do that again because that's getting really good heat it's like no it's not it's just it's just so ridiculous and unbelievable that everyone tuned in to see it to see if it was true you know what i mean like there's mm -hmm. a difference and then because i would voice this that was where the thing you know big basically decided in his mind that despite the fact that by the time he got there I was getting over as a baby face. I was, I had the credibility. I was already being like tipped as the sort of, as the, as the breakout sort of guy. He just blatantly just said, I made you like, he goes, I, he can't like later on. We, we didn't have that discussion that you're referring to where you said like, why didn't you just have a conversation? We didn't have that till months later because I guess both of our prides in that respect, like, where until finally in New York City, I looked at Big and said, you have to pay me for the next year regardless. And I know I'm one of the highest paid guys. So either you can continue to pay me to do nothing or you can be a man and we can have a fucking conversation. And that was when we finally had a conversation. That was like three months after I dropped the title to EY. But, you know, it, I just remember just, there was this immediate like, he made this thing where he goes, I made you the champion. Like, oh, I made God. you this. I made you that. And I was thinking, like, what's what's happening? Yeah, see, I, like, yeah, I, yeah. I've yeah. never seen a guy make a more, like, total 180 as far yeah. as, like, being yeah. everybody. But suddenly he needs an assistant. Bro, I He's saw it. Around, I like, swear to God, bro. I, 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 like, I, I, I like this. Bro, but to I. Yeah. The, 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 that, that concussion. I've never told that story before. But. I'm not afraid of libelous because because the because it's the truth. Yeah. And my biggest problem with him, I don't have a you know the reason I decided I didn't want to work for him anymore, and not you know I don't care about personal feelings. I can separate business and personal, right? And personally get along with everybody all the time. But I you know, but I the reason I decided I didn't want to do business with him anymore was when. It was the same thing again. He had he doesn't have any regard for the for the well being of the boys. And we did a segment like the last program I was in was me and James Storm, and they had Mickey involved and all that stuff. And they did the, they wrote this segment. There was a segment, and it was a good segment. It got really good. It got a really good response, and I felt like we were doing the best stuff on the show. Where like James was gonna present Mickey with this guitar. Like he had a guitar custom made with her logo and stuff. And, and it was like, what are you doing? Like, why are you like, why are you like, what's your deal here? You know, he was doing a really good job of like, I was doing a good job of portraying like this staying baby face, but kind of being like, you're kind of overstepping boundaries here without looking like a jealous boyfriend. You know, Mickey's doing a good job of kind of being like conflicted, like, thanks, but this is a bit inappropriate. And James is doing this great job of like, no, I'm just a nice guy, but I'm really evil. You know what I mean? It was a difficult thing to play, right? But we were doing it well. That segment, the idea is, you know, obviously it's a guitar, it's TNA, it's going over someone's head. The James has that they get this guitar made or whatever. Christy Hemi put the order in to the props people for the guitar. Of course, Christy Hemi doesn't isn't qualified to be involved in the running of a wrestling company. So she doesn't specify that this guitar is getting smashed over someone's head. It has to be 
gimmick. It has to be, you know, it and it's difficult to do. Like those props guys are great at that. Greg and, and those they got to take they got to take it apart, then put it back together. Yeah, it yeah. Takes, it takes a couple of hours yeah. to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. They yeah. don't get that. They don't get that in the memo. They just get a memo from Christy saying we need a guitar and it needs to look like this. Thank God, the day we went to shoot that segment, they had it in a in a um in a gift box with a bow around it and everything already. Thank God James said, hey, let me see the guitar. Because I don't know whether he just maybe in his mind like thought maybe they have, you know, just checking just in case. I, I mean, guarantee, I guarantee back, you know? he did. Yeah. He yeah. He gets it out and he goes, this thing isn't gimmick. We're an hour away from, from this, doing the segment. So we just go, can't use this guitar. Right? Can't smash his own, kill him, you know. We call Gaburik over. Uh, big, we've got a problem. He goes, What's the problem? Goes, well, this guitar isn't gimmick. And he just he starts screaming at the props guys. Like, what the fuck? Like, you know, da, 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 like mm. god damn it, like he, every fucking minute is something new, blah 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 blah. Like he couldn't he couldn't handle it. He can't handle being he doesn't he, he can't do it. The props guys, like, he screams at Greg Horn for like five minutes. Right. And it's the most uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. Right. Because and then he walks away and Greg holds up this memo or he gets his phone out and holds up. And he says, this is what we got from Christy Hemi. Yeah. And it says, like, we just need a guitar, blah, blah, blah. Yep. So we call Big right back over and go like, you show him what you just showed me. Right. Because everybody, nobody liked Christy. Nobody wanted her involved in any of that stuff. It, it, it rubbed everyone the wrong way. But Big and Big Christy, like Big had a hard on for Christy. And that was all there was to it with that stuff. Right. It was already rubbing everyone the right. By the way, I thought it was incredibly funny that then Christy decided to leave. I thought that was just brilliant. Anyway, this all happens, in, you know, and bearing in mind, immediately, James, Mickey and I, and Mickey has a great mind for the business and, and she's never given enough credit as a girl because she's a girl, because everyone thinks that someone else always writes all the girl stuff. She, Mickey's never given enough credit. She gets the business. She's a great worker and she's a, got a better mind for the business. When we did the GFW UK shows, I had Mickey as an agent for the guys. I anyway, believe it. So the, the, we're, we're letting all this play out, right? We just go, hey, don't don't disrespect Greg Horn and put the shit on him when it was Christie's screw up, okay? Go handle it. In the meantime, we're professionals. We've got a job to do. So we're immediately coming up with alternatives. Okay, so well, we could give the guitar and then like maybe you know, something or other, maybe I can swing the guitar and you can miss and I can smash the post, you know, and it still gets the same effect. You know, we're coming up with all these different, because the idea was that Mickey turns turns away for a second. When she turns back, James is laid out with a guitar because he swung it at me and I've stopped it and smashed him. But when Mickey only turns around, she only sees that I smashed James and then goes like, what the hell, like, what the hell did you do that for? Right. right that was, right. We, so I said, well, we can still get there. If maybe, you know, James goes to swing it at me, I duck, I deck him with something else, and then I just start smashing the guitar up against the ring or something, right? It's still the same effect where Mickey can go like, what the hell's wrong with you? You know, like, because she doesn't, and James is there secretly smiling to himself, right? We're coming up with all these different alternatives because never say no, always have an alternative, right? Never just say no. And, and there's more. there's always more than one way to get to the same spot. Exactly, right? right. So we're coming up with all these alternatives, okay? By the time all this stuff is resolved, you know, hopefully Biggs apologized to Greg Horn. I don't know, you know, and all this stuff, right? I'm sure he never reprimanded Christy, but um, he comes back to us and we go, okay, so we're coming up. I said, we're, we're trying to come up with some sort of alternative because obviously we can't use the guitar now to smash James over the head. He goes, why not? And I just, I'm like, what do you mean why not? Like, because it's a real guitar and he goes ah you'll be fine <sighs> then they basically in the end they it wasn't a live it might have been i don't know it might have been live anyway they moved the segment to try and give these guys enough time to gimmick the guitar and the guys were like well we're pushing it but we'll we'll try right because i think we had like right about 45 minutes to an hour and I still still maintained, and I think this is another reason why, you know, just me and Big, just he he just wasn't, he would just rather have an EC3 who just agrees. Well, to yeah, you, you challenged him. You know, he doesn't want right. to be challenged. Bro, but even then, even then I said, okay, Big, like, 
this is fine. But at the end of the day, like this isn't up to you. It's up to James because James is the one who has to put his health at risk. So if James is happy with the guitar, I'll hit him with the guitar. If James isn't happy with the guitar, I'm not fucking hitting him with the guitar. End of story. And he was just kind of like, ah, oh, you'll be fine. You'll hit him with the guitar. It's fine. I go, okay. But again, that's not, no offense, not your call yeah. today. And it just, I think it was just stuff like that where he just, you know, nothing against EC3. Like, I think he's a decent talent, but he, you know, he's not, he's not doing that. He's, he's not doing that. In fact, he's doing the opposite of that. You know what I mean? He's, yeah. he's buying big a bottle of wine. You know what I mean? And he's, yeah. you, know, you know, and he, it's like, I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm, you know, to me, it's, I get that you have to play the game, but there's, there's a time and a place where you have to stand up for yourself and stand up for the boys who make this what it is. Well, well, bro, he, bro, here's what blows me away. This, this, this is where it's like, listen, I, I'm going to say it again. I love Dixie Carter, the wo woman. I have no sympathy for Dixie Carter, the businesswoman, at all, and I speak my mind. Bro, this is what blows me away. Somehow, some way, somehow, some way, the internet, bro, they, they, they wanted, they wanted to blame Vince Russo for losing, for TNA losing the spike contract, a consultant. For, for them losing the contract. The, he, bro, th this is what blows me away. Spike Television was in love with Eric Bischoff, the executive producer of the show. They loved this guy. Bro, Eric worked them. He knew everything about wrestling. Yeah, Fishman would be at every taping, like, sniffing Eric's ass. Exactly, bro. Bro, Gaborik's on the job for less than a month. One of the first things he does is sends Eric home because everything was he's not going to be challenged. He's he's going to be the guy in charge. You know Eric ain't going to take any of his baloney, so he sends Eric home. Right then and there, I knew Spike is not go. They're going to say who the frig is this guy? They love Derek. Yeah. Right then and there is where I. In my opinion, the spike deal ended. The minute Eric got sent home and John wasn't going to be challenged from anybody, it was over. But here's you know what's the funny about that, Vince, is that Eric wasn't even Eric wasn't even really that hands-on at that point, so it wouldn't have really made any difference if he'd stuck around anyway. Yeah, exactly. But here, here's my point. Under the um, this is why I have no sympathy for Dixie. Under the umbrella of John Gaborik, they lost the spike deal. They lost the Destination America deal. Now you're going into a third television deal with the same guy and the same writers that are nothing but his puppets. You're going to go into a brand new television deal with that. And then in, in three months, uh, Pop TV is going to be looking at you like, well, what's going on like that that's what blows me away about TNA and where I say bro if you're not going to learn from your mistakes you don't deserve to be in business yeah you're right he would take your words and twist them and bro you know, it guys... takes years and years and years to get in a spot like that i mean people don't understand this when i work with Vince he baby stepped me all the way through the process when you got somebody who's got a little bit of an ego, bro, and they're power hungry, and all of a sudden they're head of talent relations and creative, yeah. it's funny because I remember, I remember the day that Big's first day it was in Louisville, and Eric, like, made the introduction to everyone. There was like a big talent meeting, and Eric, it was Eric, uh, Dixie, and 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 the Burick. And Eric, like, put, put John Gaborik over, like, a million bucks. Like, this guy, when I was at WWE, like, he was so good at making you look like a star. He designed these great shots. He designed, like, pre-tapes. He designed all these things. He, he knows how to frame you right and how to make you look, like, big, a big... And I remember sitting there thinking, like, That's, that does sound like exactly what we need here. You know what I mean? So I was thinking, well, maybe with, with Eric sort of doing what he likes to do, Jeff seeing being the big picture guy and handling the rest. And this guy, John Gaburik, kind of making us all look like stars. 
like we might be onto something here. And big, you know, he took me into a room that day and said, like, you're going to be the guy and blah, blah, blah. And I was, and I was like, immediately confused because I was sort of thinking, like, oh, are you in charge? Like, I was just, I thought that he was just kind of coming in to be part of the, the team. You know what I mean? So I, so I used to politely go, like, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, like, well, I'll just, you know, and he, and he but he said to me weird to me where he goes, I, I'm going to make you my guy. I'm going to hang my legacy on you and da, 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 da. I just need to know if you're in or are you out? And I, and I sort of went, I've been here for five years. <laughs> like, you know, like, well, I, you know, like that, that, that well, you like it's hard to deal with that level of arrogance where someone's just immediate in their mind. It's like, not, like, again, like to you, your point about what Eric said, like nothing existed before I showed up. Well, yeah, you know what it is? He, he, th this is the genius of Vince McMahon, bro. And everybody will tell you this who knows him. I, I'll tell you firsthand. Vince surrounds himself with geniuses in every field. Like, you know, Kevin Dunn is a freaking genius. You know, I'm not going to say Vince Russo was a genius, but he let me run with creative. Like, he hires people that he knows can get the job done. Bro, it's the total opposite with Big Way. He'll block cock people that can actually help him. Bro, he, he, here's the perfect example, and I'm not going to mention, I'm not going to mention who said this. But this is the perfect example. This is why TNA will never go anywhere, bro. Bro, a wrestler went up to Big um, and basically said to Big, you know, he kind of called out Conway and Lagana. And he was like, you know, Big, do you really think that these writers, you know, are strong enough, you know, on their own to be able to be writing this, this show? Bro, John Gaborik looked at this guy. And he said, you know, so-and-so, he goes, I need droids. I need people that are going to do what I say when I say. Bro, this is a guy that knows nothing about creative. No, that's it. You don't need that. You want that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on the other side of the coin, he can hire a, you know, class A writer so he would never have to worry about it, but... He doesn't want anybody there who knows about a certain area more than he does. And li like I say, bro, I don't put the blame on him. I put the blame on his boss because if she can't see that, TNA is never going to get out of its own way. So, bro, show me this book that you flashed because I didn't know anything about this. I've always wanted to do a fitness book. And, you know, one of the things I always get asked when I do seminars or if I, you know, when I do Q and A stuff is I inevitably always get asked like about getting in shape for wrestling and stuff. And, um, so I started doing it and then Kurt, um, has written some really great stuff in here for me. Like, and it's, so I decided to take a lot of different guys and get them to write their own input and stuff. Because to me, the guys who are always in great shape are normally guys who, the same, the same as good workers. It's like you borrow from all kinds of different people, you know, and you get this feedback and you sort of all exchange ideas and it's all trial and error. So in the midst of this, you've, there's stuff for the girls from people like Mickey and from Brooke who, are, you know, like, who, you know, who the girls, their bodies like that are no accident. There's like Rob Terry's obviously written some stuff in here and anyone who knows Rob knows he's like the most genetic drug-free freak I've ever seen. Kurt's written some really cool stuff in here. So if you're a fan of Kurt, it's like, it's really cool to get an insight into his sort of mental preparation. Now, why wasn't I asked to give some fitness tips in this book, bro? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, come on. Well, you're good at running, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro, I just saw Rob Terry about a month ago, bro. He's unbelievable, that guy, huh? Like a Clydesdale. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I could have had something in here from you, Vince, about like, running away whenever someone comes to you like hey what's the deal with this with this script yeah, oh exactly I bro i could have done that yeah so so know. now bro i mean where can we get that book um so it's i mean it's available now everywhere like i mean amazon barnes and noble you know all good bookstores like there should be physical copies in most barnes and noble but obviously it's all like all on all the ebooks kindle nook and all that stuff but to get like the full list or to order a signed copy you can go to superstarbodybook.com Superstar body book. Bro, you know, listen, I'll end the interview on this. You know that Dixie Carter has one of those books buried in her pajama nightstand next to the bed. Oh. I mean, not for any, let's call a spade a spade, bro. <laughs> 
Now, Nick, tell us about the Twitter. I don't know if you do Facebook. I know you do Twitter. How can everybody follow you? Um, yeah, Twitter is my only sort of uh, my only direct Nick all this thing. Oh, and Instagram. I don't have a Facebook page just for me. Like I do have a, like a private one for Facebook, and I have one for the Superstar Body. But I don't. But I. Uh, um, but yeah, my Twitter handle is still at Magnus Official. Um, I just never bothered to change it because I figured that's still how most people know me. So until that changes, I won't change it. And then my Instagram is at Nick Aldis. Well, thanks a lot, bro. Listen, have a great holiday. Uh, uh, give Mickey my love, and thank well, you so much for joining us, bro. But thank you very much. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Well, Magnus, I have to ask you this. Listen, I appreciate you, you taking care of young Donovan. I think that's very, uh, that is very manly and very fatherly of you. But I have to ask you this. Once, you know, you got together with the beautiful Miss Mickey James, were you at least able to get rid of that rat dog? Don't, don't tell me that rat dog is still running around and now you're taking care of Donovan and the, and the rat. Is that, please tell me at least the dog left. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Elvis. Elvis. I can't get him to come. Well, you know what the good thing is, Magnus? At least you locked the dog in a closet. I like that, bro. <laughs> All right? I, I, I respect that. I like him worse than that. He has a cage that we put him in when he's bad. Hey, let me ask you this, though. Let me ask you this about Mickey, because everything was the Elvis dog, and the Elvis dog used to own the women, woman's locker room, the whole nine yards, and enough with the dog. But now that Donovan is in the picture, I'm sure Elvis is taking a back seat and probably doesn't like it. Yeah, Elvis is taking a back seat, and I'm on the roof rack. <laughs> now, is Mickey home? Now, does she know you lock Elvis in the closet when she's not home? She comes home and finds him in the cage and says, like, oh, what did he do this time? You know, <laughs> it becomes some, some sort of excuse. So, Magnus, how old is Donovan now? Donovan, he's, uh, he's, he's going to be 15 months on Christmas Day. Now, 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 was fatherhood anything like what you were doing? I mean, I mean, Magnus, were you one of those guys, you know, put the kidding aside, you know, the, the handsome man, but were you one of these guys that always wanted a, a, a family and always wanted a child? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it certainly wasn't, it certainly wasn't planned, you know, and it wasn't something that we were anticipating at that moment. Um, but I think that the, yeah, I, I think I'd always seen myself eventually, you know, having, having children and I, I honestly, you know, having a son, I think, but um, it's been, it, it's, it's funny because it, it, you know, it ties in with sort of um, some of the career decisions I made subsequently but it just the i just immediately had this complete sort of um reshuffle of my priorities and and you know you dedicate your energy to the things that are important and i just suddenly realized i almost almost overnight realized like how much energy i had wasted over the most pointless things that you have no control of and how i would get you know i got so so angry about the, the, the most ridiculous things and how insignificant those things are in the end. And also just, I just, I, I feel like I just matured like overnight because I, I just went like, I don't have time for any of this crap anymore. Like mm. I have time for this and my priority is to make a good living and to, and to sort of take pride in what I do and, and set a good example for my son. So, you know, in a lot of ways it helped me, uh, in, in a direction, I guess, that I knew I was, I was, you know, destined to take as far as deciding to leave DNA. I'm going to, I, I want to follow up on that in a second. I think it's very important. But, but before I do, is it fair to say, uh, you said that the uh, pregnancy was not planned. So is it fair to say that once we found out that the lovely Mickey James became present, uh, uh, pregnant, uh, that Dixie Carter released her from TNA? Is that fair to say? <laughs> All right, listen, let me go on, Magnus, with the conversation. Well, Mag, I, bro, hold on a second, bro. Gee, my nitly, what the heck? Hold on, man. <laughs> See, Max, I don't have the big yeah. money to have a big 
podcast studio. I do everything in my my office. My dog wanders in and out. Don't let him bother you when he comes in. Let's talk about this Russo den we've got here. This is this is a cave. It's incredible. It's incredible. I want to start at the beginning. I, I, I really, bro, bro. Do you watch Seinfeld at all? Yeah. Uh, you, you know you know the Festivus episode. I'd have to see it. I'm George not, I, Frank Costanza, George's father, doesn't ce uh, celebrate Christmas. He celebrates Festivus, yep. and there isn't a Christmas tree. There's the metal pole, and right. he calls Festivus is where the day that everybody files their grievances. That's what I want today to be for you. I want you to <laughs> file all the Vince Russo grievances. But uh, you said some interesting there, uh, Magson. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but bro, I, I'm I'm old and I have ADD. If if I don't ask you something on the spot I'll forget it. Oh, I know. But while you're sitting there saying, you know what, I'm I'm not ready for the spot. Like you knew you weren't. But were you also thinking the political side of it? Wait a minute. Dixie Card is contacting me. There are guys in that company that have been there for a long time. They don't know me from Adam. They know nothing about me. They want me running in. I'm not ready. So like were you thinking like Twofold. Number one, I'm not ready for the spot. And number two, politically, my first day on the job, this might not be a good idea. Or did you not even really understand that into the business at the time? Right. I didn't understand that. Okay. Again, okay. Coming from England where there was, you know, not to say that you didn't pay your dues, but like it was all, all of the respect stuff and everything else just pertained to like housekeeping, right? Like, oh, you have to sit at the back of the like the minivan, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, you like let the veterans go first when it comes to like food and not all that kind of stuff. It wasn't, you know, it was never about like the, like the, the other side of things. There was no, but well, and also the fact that Brian Dixon, who was the main promoter I worked for, he didn't play favorites, you know, yeah. apart from maybe his son-in-law, but it was like, there, you know, no, there was none but, of that. But, but, but I, I want, I want to back that up, Magnus, because I've worked I, for IPW UK three yeah. times now. Do you know Daniel Edler? Yeah, I worked for Dan when I got and, back. And what you're saying is so true because I got to tell you, uh, Magnus, when I was there, like, I didn't witness any politics. Like, I never, it was such a group environment. Everybody was on the same team. It was so, oh my God, I loved it. I loved yeah. the environment. I loved the atmosphere. I'm just interrupting you because I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, so, so no, to answer your question, no. When, when, when that particular um, situation was brought up, I wasn't sitting there thinking like, oh, I'll have heat with the boys. Because I didn't really understand, you know, I, I never thought in that vein. And unfortunately, um, that now, I th especially at WWE, from what I hear, I can't comment on it because I've never been there. But from what I hear, and certainly it, it crept into TNA's water supply too towards the end of my run there, is that, that dominates the thinking of so many of the talent now. And that's a horrible place to be creatively. It's, yes. it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring out the best in a performer when you're walking around all day worrying about who you're going to upset. It's terrible, bro. And it's it's terrible. It. You can see it in people's eyes out yeah. there. You know, some guys, not all of them, but certain guys, I can watch them and go, look at his eyes. Like, he don't, he's not feeling this. He's just making sure he doesn't upset anybody. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of like, at some point you have to go, and I did this, at some point you have to go, like, if I upset somebody, then too bad, you know, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it this way and try and get over. Yes. But um, but yes, to answer your question, no, it didn't come into my thinking. And luckily, it never happened because I, I I couldn't I was I was booked already. I couldn't make the thing. But I was I you know I did those first shows on the live events and I worked with uh, I worked with Creed the first night, who's who's now doing great as Xavier Woods. Um, I worked with Matt Morgan a couple of nights. Um, he took pretty good care of me, to be fair to Matt. And then uh, I worked with Davari, and that and and that was when immediately I understood what the difference between a, a a wrestler and a really good worker is. Because Davari, to me, Sean took such good care of me. He he was sick, like he had really bad food poisoning. He was sick as a dog that whole tour. Like I hadn't even seen him because he basically crawl into the building, put his stuff like lie in the fetal position in the dressing room all, all day and all night and then he'd go out for his match, have his match and go right back to it. He was really in a bad way. And he wrestled me at Wembley and just 
just held my hand and just made me look so good and like help like help me through like the most easy but good match and i immediately immediately had this like the penny dropped and i went oh that's what being a good worker is mm -hmm. like and like I was so fortunate to work with him and develop a friendship with him right off the bat because I yeah, I know that you and him have had like bro can I tell work. you he he's another guy he don't like me he t listen he takes wrestling way too seriously he don't like me bro I went to a lucha underground uh 6 months ago maybe a little longer Bro, the guy standing right next to me and trying to carry on like I'm not even there. And I turned to him. I'm like, bro, are you kidding me? Bro, if you have something to say, let's have this conversation. I don't have an issue with you. Whatever you think of me, whatever. It, life's too short. Let's right. let's settle this. I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah, honestly. but bro, let, can we let's get back to Magnus. Yeah, right. Well, and and to add to that, to uh, I just to me in my mind. At six four and two fifty, like I'm, I was I had I had no experience of being like a monster sort of character, like the indestructible kind of winning streak and like you know kind of I I was not accustomed at all to like enhancement matches, you know like I remember um, I love Shark Boy, I love Dean, he's like such a great guy, and I remember having like my first TV match with him, and as soon as I came back, like Nash goes like the hell are you giving him all that for? You should have gobbled him up. You know, and I was just like, oh, shit. Like, I've already, you know, I've already done it wrong. But I didn't, you know, I thought to myself, I can't do that. Like, I don't, you know. Um, but then I'm think I'm also thinking, and all this is internal because I never said a word back then, you know, because I was starting to become very aware quickly of, of the sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the combustible sort of nature of, of backstage politics. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking to myself, like, well, you know, Road Dog was my agent and, like, he kind of put the match together. I just did what, you know, I, I did what he told me, you know. And then back then, I think more so than today in TNA, back then there was very, very, like, the idea was good in the sense of, like, we'll have Russo and we'll have Cornette and we'll have Dutch and we'll have, brian and dilly and so people from all kind of different eras and schools of thought and the idea being i'm assuming would be that everyone would come together and we'll find the perfect yeah. you know the, 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 but unfortunately in practice in practice as you know what actually happens is you end up with camps so you'd have oh he is like he's the guy that dixie wants to get over so i'm gonna you know, I'm not going to try too hard with him. And then, oh, well, he's Jeff's guy and he's Jeff's guy. And like, he's Cornette's favorite. Like I, I could figure that out. Like I figured that out within a month. I was like, well, you know, Matt Morgan's a Cornette guy, you know, and so-and-so is a Cornette guy. And hey, Magnus, can, can, can I stop you right there? Hearing you say that, like, isn't that just pathetic? Like, isn't it absolutely pathetic? And let me ask you this, and you were able to pick up on it quickly because you are highly intelligent. Let me ask you this. What, what, in your opinion, why is it that way? I, I've, tried to, I've tried to wrap my head around it, Vince, and I, the only, I think the culture of wrestling has changed so much in the sense that there was this, and you were right there for it. There was this explosion in, in interest in what was happening backstage for real. Like that, there, there became this, and and it, it coincided right with me becoming a, a real serious mark for the business. Like I watched it all the way as a kid, but just kind of enjoyed it and was familiar with all the characters. But towards the the the, the late nineties, like ninety seven, ninety eight, was when I really started to just like eat, sleep, and breathe. WWF. WCW didn't have a very strong presence in the UK. It was harder to find. And I saw some ECW, but just kind of always just, you know, enjoyed it in small doses. But I could, there was this real emphasis on, there was this whole nother, there was this whole new element to stories, right? I'll use SummerSlam 97 as a perfect example. When Sean was the guest referee, Bret and Undertaker, in the Meadowlands, sold out. To me, at that time, I like you couldn't, you couldn't, have, I you know, you couldn't tear me away from the screen because 
you there was this you, you know there was Brett and Sean hated each other but then you also there was this stuff swirling around with everyone like that they hated each other for real so add to that that it's like a title match so then Brett says if I don't leave with the title I'm I'm um I'm never going to wrestle in the in the states and then Sean Sean says like if I if I like if I don't call it down the middle I won't either and you sort of all the way through all this is all this these incredible layers to what's going on and then you sort of almost forget that the guy who's the champion is the, the, the biggest star and the biggest draw in the history of the business in Undertaker and his entrance, the pop for his entrance at that night might be the, that's, that's like, I try, I'm struggling to think of a bigger pop I ever heard than when Taker hit the lights in the Meadowlands that night. But the, the, the thing that made it, and then the finishes like Sean, you know, he swings and Brett ducks and he hits Taker and he has to count three because otherwise he's got, you know, but the, the thing that made it was that, everyone thought that they really hated each other for real. So it added this new sort of level of intensity to everything. And you could feel it in the audience. Like, you know, plus there was the, if Brett was doing the, the anti-American sort of character at the time, which was groundbreaking, I thought it was incredible because I was on the, I was, you know, a, a British fan and I loved Bret Hart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was, you know, the American fans were almost heels to me. But, you know, at the time, no one could tell at the time what it would eventually kind of turn into which is now is to me it's like there's just this disproportionate emphasis on like what's going on backstage as opposed to what you're being shown there's there's a there's a lack of trust from a huge amount of the audience because now it's like a guy can do really well and get over to a degree by himself but the second he starts being added to more segments it's like oh he's getting a push mm -hmm. You know, and then mm -hmm. and then immediately the empathy, you know, suddenly it, it flips and it, now there's a negative connotation towards it because it's like, oh, the back the guys backstage like him. You know, and, and I think that because there's so much more emphasis on who's writing the show and who's in charge of it and who's making the decisions, because let's face it, back in the day, most of the fans, if you polled ninety five percent of the fans would have thought Vince McMahon was just the announcer. It was only after like 97 mm -hmm. that says, oh, he's the boss. Like he's making all the decisions. He decides who wins and who loses, you know? And then it sort of turns into like, oh, well, this guy also decides who wins and who loses, you know? And there was so much more emphasis on that. So instead of it being wrestling, it became Vince McMahon's wrestling, Eric Bischoff's wrestling, Paul Heyman's wrestling. Mm -hmm. as a, you know so that there was some like a, almost like a director like a movie you know when a movie director becomes so so mm -hmm. big that suddenly it's like hey have you seen the new martin scorsese film what's it called i don't know i can't remember what it's called but it's the new scorsese you know mm -hmm. and everyone and suddenly everybody wanted to be like that when before um, you get to that did you see my picture on twitter which one Crossing Abbey Road, bro. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no, I'm, I'm, I'm an honorary son. Do, do you want me to put on my British hat for the rest of this interview to make I, you feel no, more? I really don't. I got. I, I finished really your story, bro. I might, I, might, I might at some point just flash my book here. Just oh yeah, know. no, we'll sell the crap out of that book when oh. we're done. But go ahead with the story, bro. Yeah. So. And bro, I'll never forget because the problem we had with with Jeff on creative. And, bro, this isn't a Jeff Jarrett issue. This is any wrestler in that spot. That's why I say wrestlers can't be on creative. If you're an active wrestler and you're on creative, you know, bro, you've been trained to put yourself over first. Whether it's right. Jeff or Dusty or Kevin, it doesn't matter. And the problem we always had in creative was Jeff was always the champion. And every creative meeting, Jeff always wanted to talk about Jeff first again that's not a slight of jeff that's any wrestler yeah it, you know it's times like that where you know you all there would always be and i'm sure you heard it more than i did but there would always be that rumbling in the in the water supply of someone's a double agent mm. because there were times where the infiltration was so like it was so blatant you know at, and I'd be like, unless their objective is to completely lose the trust of the audience that we've built, that, that to me seems like it's the only 
it, can't, it must be the only objective to this because there's, there's, there can't be any other reason this. Let's, you know, one week you see beer money, AJ, Joe, you know, Daniels, uh, British invasion, this and that. And then the following week you see, not to run any of these guys down, they're much right, bigger right, names right. and that's the bigger stars. But then the next week you see Flair, RVD, Jeff Hardy, Hogan, uh, you know, and you go like, well, what, what happened? You know, it's not it's not about who it's not about the the, the guys. Right. It's about the fact that in the space of one, two, three weeks, it was a completely different shot. You know what I'll never forget, uh, Magnum. These are the things I wish people on the outside could see. And her name escapes me, but you might remember, bro. Who was the short woman? She had like short grayish hair. She wore glasses. She was like a rep at Universal. You know who I'm talking about? Oh, can't think of a name. It's driving me crazy, bro. Oh, she, man, she was a big smoker. She Bernie. wore the. You know who I'm talking about? Bernie. 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 This Love is that. what I wish people could see because this tells it all. Bernie was a part of the family, bro. I mean, I loved her like she was one of my yeah. own. Tremendous person, right? Yeah. Bro, I'll never forget. Two weeks. After the change, let me call it the change, Bernie came up to me and she goes, Vince, she goes, it's just not the same place anymore. She goes, I don't, I don't like this. I don't like these people. Everything is changed. It's just not the same anymore. And it was like, you know, here was an outsider who literally just took a step back and saw what was and what now is. Yeah. And within two weeks, she was like, "This is this is a different game." It's the stuff culture. like, yeah, it's yeah. stuff like that, you know, bro. That I just wish people on the outside yeah. could have seen to understand. Uh, the culture completely changed. It was so it, it it went from such a team kind of environment, like it really was a family, you know, like it really was like it, you know, Kevin again, like I I love Kevin Nash like he's been really really good to me and you know I maintain a friendship with him to this day but like he gets so much he gets so much crap still from people about you know politicking this and blah blah you know his association with obviously the, you know going back to the mid 90s and stuff but before he was there every week he was in the trenches, like he was helping guys out. He would sit and watch the show from top to bottom. He was there all day. Yeah, sometimes he might show up late and might say, like, hey, you I know, you know, I know what I'm doing today. I don't need to get here at one o'clock. He's kind of earned that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he was there all the time. Steiner would work his ass off. Like, you know, he would be there every week. Like, I was so wary when I first showed up. I was so nervous about like, oh God, like Kevin Nash, Scott Steiner, like I'm trying to think who else. Um, but those were the two in particular, just because everything I had read, which I now realize was from sort of revisionist kind of WWE influenced history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like they were, they, those two guys have never been anything but good to me and helped me. And like, you know, and then like there were other guys who I wasn't worried about at all who were like horrible to me, who were just so, you know, just, just brutal. And like Nash. I remember even Nash, bearing in mind he's been he's been in the thick of it with like a lot of this cast of characters, you know, at Nitro and stuff. Within a few weeks, even Nash came up to me and just goes like, "This isn't fun anymore, is it?" Mm -hmm. You know, and I was like, "No." Like th there was Nash never, you know, they had their own dressing room, but like Nash, Kurt, Sting, like Booker, they would all just kind of dress together in the nicer dressing room. It wasn't like this thing where it's like this is their dressing room and don't right. you dare come you know, and be like, or anything like that, they would still eat catering with everyone and all that kind of stuff. And they like, after the change, it was like, it was, there was this whole like culture of like, you don't get to talk to them. Like they're over there. You don't get to talk to them. Like this is, you know, like you're lucky that you're even here. And it was just like, man, this isn't, you know, and I, it, it that lasted for, it did get better. Like to Eric's, in Eric's defense, he did, he did come around a little bit. I don't think he has good uh, people skills at all. And I think he's actually very shy, but I think it manifests itself in a, um, a sort of antisocial kind of uh, superiority complex. But I think it's actually deep down, he's quite shy and insecure. 
so slowly he would warm a little bit and understood you know things a little better and would start to start to become more approachable but I'll t- the, the truth of the matter is is that uh those guys didn't even they didn't even like give me the time of day until we went to england and i made my return and got like arguably the biggest pop of the night suddenly it was like yeah oh hey you know how you doing you know like like suddenly it was at least getting a hello you know but i just at that point i was already starting to head down this sort of dangerous path of like it's us versus them which is not it's not a good place to be in and i got stuck in that i got stuck in that mindset for like two years yeah and that's why i left where um i always thought that in the angle with james and mickey I always thought that we, they, James should have threw Elvis on the train tracks. In the <laughs> I mean, did you, did you throw that out there at any point? Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> there might have been, there, there might have been a discussion. All right, go ahead, bro. I had, I had to get you set me up for that. I had to get it. Go ahead, bro. Segment, and I, and that was part of where I made the decision again because it's the wrestling business, you know. I'm, and this is how I make a living. Um, I once once the spike deal was gone, and I have to say, thank. I mean, the the one positive I can take away from from Big deciding to sort of you know to, to have boo boo face and and that take away a belt from me that you know that I didn't care if I had or not. Um, the one positive I can take from that is that by the time all that spike stuff had, I was way away from that. You know what I mean? Like I I, I couldn't be. I couldn't be blamed for any of that. In fact, Big, I don't know why he told me this, but, you know, it turns out that to me, and you can probably, I don't know what you can probably enlighten me on this, but it's my understanding that when I had the title for those two or three months, whatever it was, was the last good ratings on Spike. Like it was only after that, that like at that point they were, well, we had some of the best we'd had in a couple of years and then well, it started to decline. Well, bro, let me, let me tell you this first. Let me tell you this. First of all, this, this is, and again, I just, I can't believe they've lost two television deals under his umbrella. And he's, I can't even fathom that, but bro, he, he, here's the difference. A lot of people don't know this. There was a point, bro, when Shawn Michaels was the WWE champion, and bro, he was heavily under the influence on of painkillers, whatever he was taking. You know, Shawn would tell you this, bro, and bro, he was the most difficult human being to work with. It got so bad, bro, that like him and Vince McMahon were not talking. Vince Russo was the go-between. Like, Sean would tell me what to tell Vince, then Vince would tell me what to tell Sean back. They were not speaking. But, bro, the reason why I bring that up is because even through that, Vince knew what was best for business at the time was Sean being his champion. So, bro, even the ego of Vince McMahon did not let money get in the way. He knew, okay, listen, bro, the guy's a problem. The guy's a prima donna. The guy's an issue. He's what's best for business right now. I got to deal with it whether I like it or not. He did not let, well, Sean works for me. I can certainly, that never happened. Right. But so, so, so my point is, bro, like I knew I knew there was some kind of heat. Like I was nowhere near. It wasn't like I was being different. Right, of course. Yeah, no, nobody was near that, bro. Trust me. Sean, I, Sean I, will tell I, you I don't himself. know. I can't speak for that. Like, I, I've never met Sean. I'm just a huge yeah. fan of his. But yeah. I can't. But I can I can say on my worst day, the, the worst, the only day where I look back on it and go, I didn't conduct myself as well as I should have. I can only think of one day, and it was Sting's last day. Because they had, they because you know they they had a, they had us do the same again where it, like Sting wrestled me for the title and if he didn't win he had to retire because he was leaving right. Bearing in mind three months before he's just put me over clean in the middle of the ring and like done the biggest honor for me that anyone could do. Now I'm the champion and now I need ten guys to help and like this guy's leaving so it's like you made AJ look indestructible and he left. But you made me look like I couldn't be anybody. Yeah. Now you yeah, want to do the I, same yeah. thing with Sting, 
you need, I need 10. And I never said mm-hmm. like, I have to win clean. I never said I have to be the best wrestler. And like, I mean, look at, go back and watch any of my matches. I, most of the time I bump and feed. Right. And I'm going like, but I'm just saying, and this was the, this was the, the this is the only day where I just didn't, I didn't conduct myself like a champion or, or like a professional. I looked at Dave and Matt because of course big is too important. I go, so Sting, the biggest star you have, apart from Kurt and Jeff, puts me over clean in the middle of the ring at Bound for Glory when I wasn't the champion. Now I am the champion and I need 10 guys to help. Explain, please explain to me what, why, why. And Serge, Dixie Carter's husband, Serge, walks in and goes, uh, because it says so in the script. And I, I just, I said, I'm going to pretend oh, that you wow. didn't just say that to me. And then I, and then I lost it. Yeah. Like for that. And that was, that was the only day where everyone was like, Oh, like Nick's throwing a fucking temper tantrum. And I, but I felt like I deserved to, but of course I wasn't the one going to Wade Keller and going, Serge said this to me. Serge said that to me. Big said this to me. Big told me he wanted me to work with a concussion, blah, blah, blah. All they were getting was, Oh, he's having problems. Yeah. He's difficult to work with. Blah blah blah. Yeah, oh, bro, bro. Well, bro, if it, if it's any consolation, I mean, Shawn Michaels got to the level. I'll never forget this, bro. Here, here was the here was the 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 fever pitch of the Shawn Michaels promo. He said to me, "Quote unquote, you tell Vince effing McMahon if he wants his effing world title to come to my effing ranch in San Antonio and take it off the effing mantle himself." I don't think you got that hot. No. In fact, <laughs> in fact, I think the you know, I said to, you know, that was a funny thing was that like I, I've never had an issue with winning and losing. Like I've never, you know, there are times where it's important, right? But I was never a guy, and you can vouch for this. I was never a guy who was like, oh, I need to protect myself. I think I should win. You know, I can't believe it. I. I remember putting. I remember me, Doug, and Rob Terry putting over Chris Saban in a in a in a three on one handicap match, mm-hmm. and like everyone else is coming up. Like we were working with the Dudleys at the time, and the Dudleys are going to us like, "You shouldn't be doing this." Like, and I was going like, "Well, they, you know, that's that's what they asked us to do." So it, it like I couldn't, you know, the fact that he like later on, then he, he teamed mm-hmm. me up with Bram, and I I basically got Bram his job, got him over. And I love Tom to death, you know, like he's, he's, he's my, um, he's my friend. And I, but you know, later on they had me sort of tagging with him and basically just sort of, you know, the focus was on him and I was, I was okay with that. But I did say to big, I said, you know, from a business standpoint, like it doesn't make a lot of sense for like him to be the focal point. And for me, the world champion who, or the former world champion who you're paying a lot more money to, to be in this role, like this is a waste of, this is a waste of my time and a waste of yours and a waste of your money. And he was like, well, this is what you wanted. You said you wanted to be a serious wrestler. I go, I never said I wanted to be a serious wrestler. Yeah, he's I not. Just wanted, you know what I mean? It was, they they, was they just don't know how to be. About that because that was always an interesting thing to me. Like it started with Bruce Pritchard. Was that after the change and everything, there was, they, they switched around all of the like organizational structure. Like it, it used to be Terry Taylor was head of talent and Jeff, well, Jeff slash Vince Russo was head of creative. And then Bruce came in and was head of talent and creative, which I, I always just instinctively thought well, that's a bit of a conflict of interest, isn't bro, it? Bro, you want to know? You, you want to know? I'll be totally honest with you. Bro, listen, <clears throat> I've known Bruce for a very, very long time. And Bruce was like one of the fir- very first people I worked under creatively. And, you know, Bruce, Bruce is the kind of guy, like, he's a great guy, he's a funny guy, he's an entertaining guy, but it's, you know, you always, bro, you always got to watch your back when it comes to Bruce, and I hate to say that. So, bro, here's what happened. Bruce Pritchard was out of work, Nick, and, you know, his wife, you know, had cancer, and he had two very small kids. So... I know how Bruce is, but I also I, I I wanted to do the right thing. So we needed help creatively. 
So I asked Dixie if we could bring Bruce in as a as a producer, you know, to help with the vignettes and stuff like that the day of TV. Okay, uh, you know, Dixie says, "Yeah, that's fine." Blah blah blah, bro. And, and keep in mind, Nick, I know what's going to happen because I I know the players. Right. Bruce comes in, bro. Every time I turn around. He's having these sidebars with Dixie. Dixie having the sidebars with him. Literally, bro, within two weeks later, Dixie calls me in her office, and Bruce Pritchett is now my boss. Yeah. And, and th th that's exactly what I mean about how do you not learn by your mistakes. Let me ask you about this because I'm always just curious about this. Like, I, I you know, I... I didn't have much of a relationship with Bruce. Ironically, I had more of a relationship with Bruce after he left because I think we were able to speak more freely with one another. And, and, and you know, I, I didn't, Bruce, I genuinely wanted to learn from Bruce because I knew he had been around in the thick of it of when I really loved WWF. So I really wanted to learn from him because I figured, like, who better? Um, but there was just a bit, I don't know whether it was just a, he didn't, he, to me, he never, I don't think, I never felt that he fully really gave me enough uh, credibility from the beginning. And then by the same token, he didn't think that I earned enough. So it was kind of like, I, I understood it, right? And we, when we totally cleared the air about it. But am I off base in thinking that he somehow kind of um, maneuvered to get Terry out of that, out of the company? Or am I wrong on that? Man, bro, that's a good point because, you know, it, it was kind of tough with me because, like, I wasn't in the office. So, like, I really couldn't see what was going on in the office. But, bro, let's call a spade a spade. I'm sure that was a part of it. I, I mean, I know, I know Bruce sent Dixie a whole bill of goods of everything that's wrong with the company and right. what's wrong with talent and what's wrong with creative and you know of course bro Dixie still 10 years in not not being able to make up her own mind not know when she's being sold a bill of goods you know I mean bro it's happened so many times bro big Big was a freaking producer at the television studio. How do you go from being a producer to head of creative and head of talent related? I mean, how, I how does that happen? Yeah, well, unfortunately, the, the one that really shocked me was, was Andy Barton's departure because I always thought like he was going to be there forever. And, like, but I think that the other element that perhaps people don't understand, and you, 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 can, you can shed more light on this than I can, but I can certainly say from my observations there, I was you know, there six years, that the other element of all this that nobody really understands is that there was also always this conflict of the bean counter, or, or specifically Andy Barton. So you would have these plans and these sort of grandiose things, but then at the same time, it would suddenly be like, I oh, can't afford that. Mm, you know, it would be like shut down immediately. Yeah. On the other side of that, I, typically uh, the, 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 the sort of pay scale of wrestling hasn't changed all that much with the exception of like the huge influence that like Nash and those guys had with the guaranteed contract, right? And I had a guaranteed contract at TNA. I was very grateful for it. Certainly wasn't that, certainly wasn't anywhere near that ballpark of money, but it was you know, a comfortable living. But typically the pay scale has to be like rewards based you know it has to be based on like what business you're doing but in tna it was like the opposite you had to it was almost like you had to convince them ahead of time that you were going to be worth like x amount of money for them to, in, in order for them to give you the tv time and the and the house show bookings and stuff to make it work i remember like having a conversation with scott where we would you know we were shooting for a certain amount or whatever and scott was like there was some discussion where at some point or other Guy Blake, Dixie's attorney who was hand, who was doing my contract or whatever, Guy Blake says he says something well, you know, Scott, like they have plans to make Nick the champion you know, and Scott goes so? Like, what, what's yeah. that you know what I mean? Like, what's that God's doing? But that's the point, like, that's the whole, like, that's the whole culture is this push versus pay yeah. like, as if I was going to go, oh, 
they are. Yeah, well, but 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 well, but, yeah, but then just give me that money. You but know? bro, you got to understand some 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 talent would say that. Oh, dude, and that's that's exactly what I'm getting to. Is it? Yeah, that is the bigger concern. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Overall, is that unfortunately, and it's proven now with who had the title, you know, or who I don't know who has it now. Like no one has it, right? I don't know. But when you look at like who was, and I said that there's you, you know there's your answer because you take push versus pay and the guys who take push in TNA will, will always, but you know, again, it was funny because it was, that was always the joke was that like you had to, if you got good money, you'd be on every show. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but you had to convince them before, you you know, before you even, you know, before you could prove that you were worth that money. Like in my case, you know, Raphael, who's a great guy who was in charge of the live events when I was a champion, he would always make a point to me and say, Hey, uh, last time we were here, the house was this, and this time it's this. It's up. You know, the houses have been up consistently since we've been champion. I'm not saying it's just because of you, but it's just a good thing to know. He would always give me all these little things, yeah. you know, and like the guys would say, Oh, you know, the ratings are up. Like on average, they're up, you know, a, a point or something since you've been champion, blah, blah, blah. I would keep all this stuff in the back of my mind. But it's like, it didn't really matter because I had a guaranteed contract. But you have to sort of, as the problem is, you have to like, you have to, um, <laughs> convince them of what you're going to be worth in order for them to give you the the the, 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 the tv time and the house shows like yeah. and it was always a backwards way of yeah. doing things because bro, andy barton would say well we're paying him all this money like he has to be on it you know yeah exactly bro i i'll never forget man like i swear bro it was my first week at at tna my first week it was when jerry jarrett was was still involved you know and, bro, I'll never forget, they were putting together the budget or whatever. And, like, bro, they were giving some guys, like, a hundred bucks to wrestle. And I remember looking at Jerry. I, bro, I, ever since I got hurt in the ring, I really learned firsthand, bro, every time you step in the ring, it could be your last match. I, I, I learned that firsthand. So the way I look at it is you're going to pay this guy a hundred bucks. This guy could break a neck and never work again for a hundred bucks. So I remember looking at Jerry and I'm saying, Jerry, you can't you can't pay the guy a hundred bucks. And I remember Jerry looking at me, bro, and he laughed and he says, he goes, Are you kidding me, Vince? These guys will pay us to be on our TV show. But that's true. Bro, that's true. There are so many guys, Nick, in the business that they are such marks for themselves and such marks for wrestling that they've forgotten that it's a business. And literally, bro, yes, they will pay you to be on their show. So unfortunately, since you have some people who conduct business that way, they try to get away with that with all of the talent. Well, and, and even if you're the good, and the problem is, is that unless you have a strong enough contingent of guys who work in the other direction, you become labeled as the troublemaker. Exactly, bro. Exactly. You get you're not, no one's going, no, the boys aren't kind of like, well, and it's the other thing too about wrestling is the boys are their own worst enemy, right? Like, I'll, this is, this is, again, you know, this is the God's honest truth. I'm only saying this because it's true. I wasn't proud of it. But in my last year at TNA, I helped about seven or eight guys try and negotiate their contract because i was because none of them they didn't have agents and they didn't have anything like that they hadn't they didn't have any experience of it and the contracts they were being offered were so insulting that they would come to me like i remember this one night in in uh, in new york city we were when we were doing the tv shows at the manhattan center and the you know the hotel's like connected to the building so we were you know so we were all right there and we're getting ready to go out and we, we were sitting in a room and it was like there was about five or six of us and one I, I, I won't say who it is but he's but he it was one guy had asked me specifically like hey can I is it cool if like we get together later and I ask you about my deal like and, and, and ask what to do I said sure I said I don't I don't know how much help I can be but I can just tell you you know from my own experience like what I would do and within an hour, there were like five guys in there <laughs> and they all had their offers and they're all going, well, what do you think I should ask for? Like, cause they're at the moment it's like, and I just go, if any of you sign any of those, you're insane. 
you know, and, and it was like, and, and before I, and I, and, and it, at the time I, I kept stressing to everyone, like, guys, like you please, please, please cannot mention this to anyone because, you know, I, like, I didn't intend for it to turn into this, but like, it will get blown way out of proportion. It'll look like I'm telling everyone, like, you know, come to me. And that wasn't what happened at all. It was one of my close friends. And then as the other guys were showing up to like, just to come and hang out, they all wanted to do the same thing. But it was how bad it was getting was that I was, you know, the only, because they all knew that I was, because I would always, because that was the thing is that I want, especially after Donovan was born, I just adopted such a different mindset. I would just show up and be like, when we started doing those TVs in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, I would just start showing up. I would do whatever. I remember one night I did a, a tag match where like I took the, I took a choke slam from abyss into tax, you know, and just did it. Did it came back, smile on my face. Like, thanks guys. Cool. I got heat for that in New York because big goes, you know, nowadays you just walk through and you don't even talk to us. I went, hold on. I'm like, so, so I had heat when I was talking too much. <laughs> when I was questioning everything. Now I have heat because I go out and do whatever, whatever silly shit you want me to do. And I say, yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you very much. And get my money. And now, now I have heat for that too. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, Cause he cited that, that night specifically goes, you, you went out there and you like killed yourself. You know, you took a choke slam on tax and like, we were all there waiting for you to like congratulate your stuff. And you just walked right by us. Like we didn't exist. I went, so yeah, I said, isn't that what you want? Bro, I just, it wasn't like I walked by, like, I was, it wasn't like I walked past like, fuck you guys. Yeah. I just came back and went like, cool. Thanks guys. I'm going to get cleaned up. Yeah. Bro, did, did, did this, this did, pack sticking in my back. There's so much BS involved. And that was the thing with me, bro. And, and, and you, bro, you're a lot younger than me, but it, it, it's, it's, it's happening to you. It's like, Bro, there's so much BS involved, and you know it. And you know what, bro? It's kind of it's okay, like when you're younger, but it's like the older and wiser you become, you're like, you know what? That's not worth all the money in the world. I mean, that's that that's literally what happens with me as I get older and older. It's it it's never gonna change. It has never changed, and it's like, you know what, bro? You can. Uh, you, you 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 can keep that. I I don't need that in my life because there's no winning, bro. There, there's absolutely no winning, bro. I want to ask you. This is going to be the last question, bro. This is the longest interview I've ever done. Just so you know, the law. I swear, as a shoot, bro. This is two and a half hours. I never interviewed anybody this long before, but I got to ask you this question because I remember seeing this online, and I said to myself two things. I said number one. This is going to be one of the best angles they've ever done. Or number two, they are more stupider than even Vince Russo thought they ever were. Okay, bro? I remember specifically, I think it was on the TNA website. It was, it was on their website. There was a picture of you and Jeff shaking hands and announcing that you were joining Global Wrestling Federation. What is it? Global Force Wrestling, okay. right? I always get that confused. Global Force Wrestling. You're there with Jeff. It says, you know, your Magnus signs with Global Force Wrestling. And in the background was the Impact logo. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, obviously they're shooting an angle. That Magnus is going to Global and it's going to be this big angle. Because if these guys are shooting... That Magnus is signed with Jeff, and there's a TNA logo in the background. They are more inept than I ever imagined. What was the deal with that photo? I didn't. I'll, I'll go on record to say I love Jeff Jarrett, but I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't like that. He kind of put me on the spot. Okay, and I've told him about it since. But um, it's, are you sure that it was on the TNA website and it wasn't on the? Global Force website. It might have been, bro. I don't want to. I don't want to say definitely. Yeah. I don't want to say definitely. TNA website. Then you're right. That's it, it, that's insane. Like that's yeah. beyond. Like that's that's beyond in it. Um, but no, that did happen. Um, <laughs> so Jeff, obviously, I knew I had seen what Jeff was doing, and after Rinker King, I had always had and 
I had always had a, a deep appreciation for Jeff because he'd been the guy that had like given me the chance to really be like a, a serious talent and like a player and you know and then had also then influenced TNA to do the same thing kind of shone a light on me and said to like Eric and guys like that like look this you know this is what you could have with this guy um he also produced a lot of the good stuff that I did in 2013 prior to winning the title so um when I saw that he when he left I knew I was just that was that was the day right like when AJ left no one ever thought AJ would leave because he loved TNA so much Big obviously thought the same thing, which is why they offered him so much less money, and he said no. Then when Jeff left, I was like, the only guy that loved TNA more than AJ was Jeff, and if he's gone, then this this place is done. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, you know, here's me, literally holding the ball. You know what I mean? Like Jeff just like, I, I really felt like a player who who like would you know who his favorite coach had just left because I and here's me holding the title, going like. Oh God, like, I don't know what to do anymore. So I knew what Jeff was doing, you know, um, and I knew, I I saw that he was sort of starting things up with global and everything like that. Um, And I basically had a discussion with TNA about two weeks before my contract expired, where I, where, you know, we had, Bob had had me fly into Nashville and we'd had a discussion about my contract. And I basically said, I'm going to make it easy for you. Like, unless you're going to, unless everything's going to stay the same plus $1, I'm not staying. You know, I said, because it, I'm certainly, because the company is not in the position it was. You don't have Spike anymore. You know, like, there's no other reason for me to stay other than financial. You mm-hmm. know, like, I've done everything I can do. I've been the champion. The, you know, I, there's less eyeballs on me. Uh, there's no one here left that I want to work with because you've lost everyone, like, unless you're going to keep paying me to, like, unless you're going to pay me for the position that I represent to the, to the company now as like, a, you know, as more of a sort of leader and a top guy, then there's no point. I'm not going to, I'm not a mark, you know, I'm not going to stick around just to keep doing it. Um, and that was pretty much the end of discussion. I basically said, I don't, I don't want to stay. Like I want out, like it's time for me to do something else. And then Dixie, was like kind of weird about it at first like she doesn't you know she's not very good at facing the facing the music and that yeah, fact, yeah. i love dixie to death but finally we had a, a discussion and she sort of said it was okay i just told her the truth and said well i don't really know where i'm going to end up i don't know what i'm going to do next but i do know that i'm sure that i'll end up working with jeff in the interim you know to help him get global off the ground and she goes that's fine you can talk to jeff so i'm like oh all right you know like you know, and it, I start talking to Jeff and he's obviously like, oh, this is great. You know, we'll, like, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, let's, we'll plug you into all the live events and da, 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 da. I didn't know they were going to be at that taping, which was my, you know, which would end up being my last one. So I'm there just like ready to just try and sort of have a good last few days and finish on a high note and leave. And then, of course, the first thing I see is this, you know, they, they loved working the boys. Like they became obsessed. Eric was the guy who started this and then they became obsessed with this. After that. They wanted to keep doing stuff where they worked the boys and it was just, you know, and it was just like, I never understood it. But anyway, Jeff and Jeff and Karen show up and walk straight out with the TV and, you know, whatever. But I remember I, I wasn't, I wasn't in love with it because I just was like, now it looks like my stuff's an angle. Yeah. But I was legitimately leaving and I didn't, and I, and Sanjay felt the same way. We were like, I don't, this, this doesn't benefit you. It benefits them, you know, because they get, they're the ones with the TV show that they need to rate. Right. Like they're, they're benefit, benefiting from you. You think you're benefiting from getting your brand and stuff on their TV, but like, it's toxic. It's a toxic TV it's yeah. a toxic brand. You don't want to be associated with it, but you know, we, we just voiced our opinion. That's Jeff's, you know, it's Jeff's right to decide what he wants to do, but I'm just getting ready to go and I like I was just I was in street clothes so I must have I must have either been done for the day or been there to like Mickey had a segment I don't remember what specifically was going on unless it was just you know it was one of those big blocks of TV tapings and I was just there hanging out because it was my last you know because like like I knew I had the match at the end of the week and I'd already shot the stuff probably shot the stuff earlier that day or whatever but I was just there to hang out with my friends because I knew I was leaving Jeff and them are getting ready to do their thing. And Jeff suddenly goes, hey, come here for a sec. Like, let's take a picture. 
uh, and just you know it was just so quick like that that you know it wasn't and it was like put me on the spot in front of everybody i wasn't exactly you know i wasn't i couldn't exactly go like no Joe, like this is in bad taste you know like it's in front of the impact logo. And i didn't know what they're going to do with it and then next thing i know boom <laughs> like, and i it was deliberate you know yeah, like he, yeah, yeah. like i know what jeff he did that on purpose and yeah. like every no one can figure it out everyone thinks it's i mean i just you have to just laugh about it yeah, bro, I'm trying to make nice. I'm trying to. I, I've been. I, I was, you know, really tight with Jeff for 20 years. I'm Jeff. Jeff has not spoken to me, bro. They hired me as a consultant, basically with the caveat: if you say anything, the gig's over. Okay, bro. At the time, I had no job, no nothing, and I needed the money. I wasn't podcasting. I just lost a business, bro. I started a business. I lost 50 grand in like three months. So I was in a position that I really needed the money. Um, and, you know, they're like, okay, you could be a consultant, but nobody can find out about it. I said, okay, no problem. I didn't tell a soul. I went about my business. Well, on their end, bro, Jeff found out through a conversation with, um, uh, what's the name, the mother, Janice. Janice was on the phone, and Jeff was in a meeting with Dixie, John, and uh, Di uh, John, John and Jeff. And Janice asked John the question, "So how's Vince working out?" That's where Jeff found out I was consulting. Bro, he he hasn't won't, hasn't given me the time of day since. And you know, I mean, I've reached out to him, and I'm just like, bro, I don't know what what you expected me to do. That's what they hired me under those pretenses. I had no choice. But I hope to, uh, you know, I I haven't given up, bro. I keep DMing him. I hope to talk to him. Hey, Magnus, I want to ask you this about the global. You know, because you're a smart guy, but maybe you don't know this. But as as I sit back and I watch what Jeff's trying to do, and obviously, bro, I mean, I think we can assume the biggest hurdle is going to be the television deal. Bro, is it not possible to have a national wrestling company in 2015 stream on the internet alone and be able to be able to have a a, a solid financial business doing it that way? I I have I mean it definitely seems to be the way it's going. I don't. I think if the, I think if the if the TV product itself was good enough, and and when when you see the stuff we filmed in Vegas, it's definitely good enough. Like from a production value standpoint, it looks phenomenal. The Orleans Arena, they did. They were great. They were great to us. The uh, you know uh, we had Sully was was there. You know Sully you know directs everything. He's a, he's a genius with that stuff. He makes these incredible videos. A lot of the talent, you know, they called on a lot of us to film a lot of stuff ourselves. You know that they could then splice into the videos because of the way they want to try and produce something a little different. Um, Keith Mitchell was you know Jeff Jeff threw all his eggs in the TV production basket mm -hmm. as opposed to the talent basket. Like the talent, you know. The, the, the sort of the, the top talent that they had or have, you know, those shows was like me and Bobby Roode and uh, Chris um, Masters and Lebetsky, you know, and uh, EY, like, and then, you know, a lot of it's just guys he's trying to build from, you know, start afresh with a new roster, right? So well, it certainly wasn't like, but he, but where he, where he threw all his, you know, where he really threw his money at was the, was the production side of things. And it shows, they look, those shows look great. Um, I, I mean, I'm only privy to what Jeff allows me to be privy to. As I know that there is some, I know some pretty big, significant players in the UK as far as like TV and stuff is concerned. But I think he try, wants to try and roll everything out at once. Yeah. But to me, I just think that the the future has to be in on demand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, you know, whether it be, but to me, like Netflix is the is the golden, you know, it would be the absolute. Yeah, golden. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you know, other and then there's competing. There you know there are other companies competing for you know for some of the slice of that pie. I think going after television networks at this point is might be a slight you know might be 
might be a kind of misnomer because by the time you kind of get some traction with it, I feel like that whole model is going to be obsolete and we're going to be in all under that. So, so, so basically the company is in a position where like you filmed all this and listen, bro, obviously I know Sully and, and Keith and all those guys. So you filmed some really top-notch television, uh, but really at this point, like you don't know what you're going to – we don't know where it's going to be? Yeah. Basically. Okay. Because we did 10 episodes. We filmed. We filmed. We filmed ten episodes. That, One hour. Yes. That, to my knowledge, have been fully edited at this point, and you know, uh, broadcast ready. Wow! Um, wow! So I, I, you know, I know that they've been working really hard on on that side of things, and then Jeff, in the meantime, is trying to. We've been. I, I've been QBing the UK live events. Like we had two in October. One was sold out. We've got some more coming up in March. So I'm sort of QBing on that. And then he's partnering up with a lot of good independent companies, just, you know, kind of like an almost going backwards to go forwards on the live event market thing, kind of like the old days of having regional promoters for each, you know, area for under, yeah. that, under that banner, which I think is smart. Yeah. He's got the minor league ball fields yep. deal. Like he kind of, he managed to get that from under TNA's nose a good move. Yeah, I even heard, bro, I mean, this was pretty cool. I mean, I'm a huge baseball mark, and the uh, the winter meetings were just out in Nashville like two weeks ago. I had even heard that Jeff was at the winter meetings trying to make deals for the uh, for the ballparks, which I thought was pretty cool. Probably, yeah. I mean, he, you know, we did a, we did a lot in the summer, you know, and there were, some, were, some were good, some were, you know, so-so, but they were all profitable, which is obviously the, the yeah. key element here, and, and so I think it's definitely embryonic and from a talent perspective um you know it i have it is a, it is a step back in some ways and i only mean that in terms of career because it's like i make you know I'm not making the same money i was making at all and you know and no exposure so it's i'm i'm taking that risk to be part of a startup and i'm enjoying it and the atmosphere backstage at those tv tapings was so awesome like i can't describe how there was such a smaller team of people which meant the atmosphere was so much better there was none of this like go and ask him go and ask them yeah, go and ask yeah. Her, what is he thinking yeah bro you know it's funny i went to a lucha taping lucha underground and it was the same environment i mean they were uh, the big difference is bro they treat that like a television show and not a wrestling show and the environment there was tremendous. I mean, I had That's never right. experienced. That's what I keep hearing, like you know, Davari and like we used to be roommates, so we're still close. And like you know, a lot of the guys like who were there, they all said the same. I just I, I got hurt in Mexico. Like I was down there working with a bunch of those guys, like Willie Mack and a lot of the guys that are doing like the Lucha Underground stuff. And you know, yeah. I told them like I'm jealous, guys. Like it sounds fantastic. It's great, you know, bro. It's great uh, bro, I swear, I swear to God, I was down there and I was like, you know what? Like, honestly, like, this would be the only place, like, that I would want to work, you know, and probably, like, just as a consultant. But I swear to you, bro, after spending two days there, I was like, this, this, this freaking place don't need a Vince Russo. I mean, that, yeah. that, I mean, that, it was, it, it's unbelievable. So, so, bro, when are you going to be back in action now? Um, probably, well, I have, I'm, I, I, luckily, by, at least from a financial standpoint, a lot of the bookings I had could I, I couldn't take. Like Mickey could take my place, so like we didn't lose any money in that regard. I've got bookings in. Um, I've got some bookings in February that I'm sort of tentatively taking, and then I have a few appearances in January that I'm again like sort of taking it day by day, and and the promoters are being very good about it and sort of saying like, hey, you know, we'll work it out. Um, but I would say like I'll be back in action, like for definite by the by the end of February. I mean I have to be by March because I'm booking the UK BFW show. So bro, that's a beautiful thing that Mickey is out there. She's the breadwinner right now. The only thing bad is if she watches this thing, she's gonna see that you lock uh, Elvis in the closet all day long. You might get a little heat over that, bro. She she seen me do a lot worse to Elvis. I threw I threw a pitcher of water on him once. <laughs> bro this mu this must be phenomenal with you now 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 donovan you said he's 15 months right bro but bro he's not at that point yet like because bro my kids are 
way old now. But he doesn't really grasp or understand Christmas or anything yet at this point, does he? I don't know. Like with you know, I mean, if you ask Mickey, it's like you you would think that he does. Right. So like, obviously, last year was his first Christmas, but he was tiny, you know. So right. It, like really, was very much just like a sort of a token thing. This year, I think a little more. Like I think he's definitely he definitely can understand the concept now of you know if you you know what what babies are like when you start with if you if you put something over then they, you know, then they're going to gravitate to it. Like, if you go, oh, <laughs> you, know, like, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like there's that. And obviously everyone wants to, he's like the crown prince, you know, of the whole, of the whole family tree at this point. Because right. From my family, when they come over from England or when we go to England and obviously all Mickey's family who are all local to us here in, in Virginia. So it's like, he understands that like, there's a, you know, it's a, there's something special going on. And like, yeah. we, have, you know, we have to, we had to, readjust all of the living room to make room for the tree and all that kind of stuff so he understands like there's something different going on but yeah it's just a happy kid all the time anyway so i don't that's cool you obviously can get that from me you know yeah no cool. yeah forget about that bro now what about you want to plug anything for mickey because i i was i saw her um i was going through your guys's uh twitter feeds the other day and i saw that she's still singing and performing i mean is there anything you want to tell us about well, I mean, Mickey's, I mean, if you go, Mickey, all of Mickey's stuff is super easy. It's all at Mickey James. So her Facebook has like over a million likes. It's like facebook.com slash Mickey L James, I think. And then her Twitter is at Mickey James and her Instagram is at Mickey James. But obviously, if you find one, you can find them all. Um, and she's working a lot with this new social social thing called Empower. Um, so that's, and so you can find all, you know, in mickeyjames.com. It's, it's pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. If you type in Mickey James, M-I-C-K-I-E you know, James, and you'll, you'll find everything that you can about her, all her booking information. You can get links to her booking agent uh, for wrestling or for music. She's got, um, I mean, yeah, she, we, we already have quite a lot of stuff lined up all through 2016 for, you know, and, and on her side of things, on the wrestling and music side of things. Um, I know she's, I know she's in talks with some about a big country festival up in, New York, up in New York, up in like Woodstock, New York and stuff like that. So she's excited about some of that. Um, we're getting married on New Year's Eve. Oh, congratulations. I was just, I, I wanted to ask that question. I didn't know if it was out of line or not. I'm well, glad you told me, bro. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. We just, you know, so everyone just assumes that we're already married. We just never yeah. got into it, you know, and it was just one of those things. And then, so, so we're getting married on New Year's Eve. So that's like taking up all of our time. It's just like all of so, our bro, time. you're going to be like the big wrestling power couple now. Well, I don't know about that. With two unsigned, two unsigned <laughs> in- <laughs> power couple, yeah, yeah make but, it for a hundred and stuff. But very much in demand, bro. Very much in demand. Oh, let's hope so. Let's hope. Hey, Nick, I want to ask you one quick question, and then I'm going to let you go. And, and this is an absolute shoot, bro. I've been to the UK three times in the last year. I never went there before, bro. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the brand of wrestling. I had a pop before when you said the uh, um, the fan participation, like that, blew me away, bro. I never, I never saw anything like that before. By the time I was done there, I was doing so much with the fans. I loved it. Bro, do you, do you long though? Like, I mean, bro, cause at a very young age, you picked up everything and came over here to the United States. Do you ever, you know, miss that and long to go back home? Uh, I do. I get to go back enough though, you know, where it's like, and and honestly, the only, the thing that the more than, more than anything else is the fact that like the business over there, like is red hot. So it, and that, and that happened in the last two or three years, especially like, it's just, it's just rocketed. So obviously for me, like, you know, you kind of think that has anything to do with me going over there the last year to business picking up. I I definitely, you know, I mean, let's, let's call a spade a spade. I mean, you know, you have to, you can't argue with numbers, right? Bro. You know who I had to put over in the UK, bro. I had to put over that, that slovenly Grado. Can you imagine this (laughs) bro? Drew just put him over in the largest, the largest, uh, largest indoor crowd attracted by a non you know, by, by an independent British, yeah. like the yeah, ICW did like 5,000 people or whatever at their uh, fear and loathing show is incredible. They, bro, they're, I, making, I, they're running the Hydro next year. Is it? How crazy is that? Bro, I got to tell you this. This is an absolute shoot. You know, going over there, like, I mean, bro, I really, I really have to listen 
to understand like everything you guys say. I mean, I really got to tune in and concentrate and listen. Bro, what? the minute Grado opens up his mouth to me, like I'm, I'm, I'm out, bro. I, I'm with you. I mean, I'm with you on that. Like Drew, to this day, I love Drew to death. But even to this day, I just go half the time. I'll just look at him and go like, <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable, bro. No, it's been really, and, and you know, those guys are doing every the whole scene over there is doing good. Yeah. So why we're you know we're trying to get a piece of it. Like we've got some really cool plans for the next uh, GFW UK shows, which should be interesting. Yeah, um, I, I was telling a lot of guys there, and this is an absolute shoot, bro. I think you would back this up. Like, they, bro, there's great talents there. I love that uh, 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 Will Ospreay, Ospreay, and bro, um, uh, what's his name? Jimmy Havoc. Some yeah. really great people. And I told those guys, I said, bro, listen, this is an absolute shoot, especially when it comes to TNA. So many of those guys are better than the 75% of the TNA roster. But I told them, I said, just travel alone. For them to fly you over there and put you up, I said, that alone is going to keep them from using you. It's got nothing to do with your talent. Those guys are great. Yeah. Oh, this, and, and I think that now, you know, you're starting to see with there's a British footprint in almost every major promotion at this point, except maybe New Japan at the moment, because, you know, because Fergal, I mean, if Fergal's not really British, but, you know, in the terms of wrestling, everyone looks at Britain and Ireland as kind of the same. And Fergal trained in, in England mostly anyway, but, you know, he's doing so great. And like between, you know, Zack Sabre is starting to really break out now. And Marty's been over for PWG again. And like, he's been like my little brother, like through the whole business, you know, and, and then obviously with us and, and, uh, you know, some of the other guys and obviously Wade Barrett and Paige are like the flag bearers cause they're in WWE. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's just a whole, I broke in actually with Paige's parents. That's who trained. Yeah, bro. I had them on the show once. Did and, you? Oh, and, and I'm telling you, bro, like literally five minutes in, I was like, how is the WWE not using this whole family? <laughs> they'd make a good re I, I think they had like a reality show for a minute i can't remember they that. did a documentary that's how i got hooked onto them bro and i fell in love with them during the documentary and i had them on the show and i'm like how is the wwe not working this into the angle uh, you can't write that stuff like oh it's tremendous yeah i mean well, that's the way in the business isn't it this the it's the stuff you know the stuff that happens for real is half the time is crazy as absolutely bro because you don't have to convince the people it is real yeah. So, well, bro, listen, thank you so much, man. I mean, bro, we, we did this for nearly three, we did this for about three hours, bro. You had to, you had to overemphasize because of my three minutes tweet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, we've talked enough now for the rest of our lifetimes, bro. We never have to have another conversation. Yeah, I'll see you in 2025. Yeah. No, bro, listen, thanks a lot for talking to me. Hey, listen, I really haven't had anybody either on from Global Force, so I'm glad you were able to come on, promote that, everything you guys are doing. And as that goes forward, man, I I'd love to have you on again so you could talk about it. Absolutely. Thank you, Vince. And, bro, really big-time congrats uh, on the wedding to you and Mickey New Year's Eve. I mean, bro, you got it all, a beautiful baby. Now you're going to get married, the whole future. It's unbelievable to me, bro, when I was looking at your bio and I had a double take that you haven't even hit 30 yet. Uh, what you've accomplished is unbelievable. Well, I appreciate it. I hope I can continue that, you know, that, that sort of path upwards. So. Yeah. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then put it on a pole again. Put it on a pole again. Put it on the pole again. And I swear to God, it's gonna get emotional as I wait to overbook the damn.